Well, all right. Welcome, everybody. <sighs> I'm a little sick today, but, you know, soldiering on here. Didn't go through the notes, so they've been gone through. I do have my Sampel, of course. I hope you do, too, because it's delicious. And I've got my Muppet Cup. Right? Muppet Cups are important. And no snacks, no tea today. I just uh, not with it today. Barely, barely got everything done. But we're here. <laughs> we're ready to talk about space. So this should be fun. I've been working on it for a week. So <laughs> a little bit more. And then that'll get us to bigger and better things. There's not going to be a stream next week because Easter and I usually travel for these things. So I'm going to be gone for like a week. Uh, and I'll be back home. And I might have one video coming out while I'm gone. I'd like to do a bunch more, but we'll see. We'll see how uh, how my schedule goes, how my motivation holds up. And, you know, one one way to think about space is as the final frontier, but no, that's a TV show. But if you think about it, there's something magical about being online, particularly in, you know, here on this live stream, for example. Or at least it, it seems that way. But I think a better way to think about this is to consider that there is a magic in being online. And this distinction in sequence or, or time uh, is important. You are all here while well, I'm live or not. You can watch this recorded. To experience the space that I've manifested. I have outlined something in time and with technology, which allows us to have enough in common so that we may commune around something, well, probably several things, that we are all aiming at. And now what's interesting is you don't have to be aiming at the same set of things, just some of the same things. It's very complex right, in, in reality. You know, it could be that you're watching this because for you, it's the amusement of the pirate getup. You know, maybe you're a steampunk fan and you like the monocle or whatever. Or perhaps you're watching this for better sense-making. Like, oh, you know, this pirate guy does this weird sense-making stuff and teaches us uh, the way he thinks about the world, and that's interesting because I don't think about the world the same because that's rare enough. Or maybe you're just curious as to what I'm going to say about the term space. And those are, you know, just three sort of quick ways in which we can commune because we're aimed at similar things. And, you know, look, when you're doing something, you're doing a lot of things. You're not, you can't do one thing. That doesn't make any sense. And so what that, what that means is that I'm doing a lot of things to try and allow a lot of people to commune within this space, right? I'm creating a space where we can commune. And there's lots of other possibilities for sort of high aims or common aims or whatever. So I'm not going to list them, you know, list any more of them or, or you know, I'm not trying to get a complete list or anything like that. You can work some out for yourself if you'd like, but you know, if you do that, write it down because it's a good exercise. It'll help you know more about yourself and hopefully others uh, to sort of see, well, what, what, what are the things that we might have in common uh, within any given space, uh, not just this one? So it's a good, it's a good little exercise, right? What, what is it about, you know, the gym that I go to twice a week or what is it about work, right? That's a space that where you commune. What are all the things we have in common? Um, and you go on and on and on with that. It's a good, it's a good exercise. Write it down, though. Write it down. It's, it's helpful. 
So the online space, sort of in particular, allows us to commune in, in various ways, right? There's various methods. Um, some of them are via one-way communication, say text, that'd be like forums or Facebook posts, right? Or voice, right? Where you get on and speak to people uh, or video, right? Or some combination, right? And then all those same things apply with two-way communication, right? Like if, if you if you stay long enough, you can probably hop in later and right then then it's two-way communication. Uh, some people still be one-way communication. That's okay, right? And this space where we are now <clears throat> has a, a common aim, right? It's got common aims. It's got tools that allow for communication and not just communication, but binding, right? You're here for a reason. Um, and I'm not just blathering out word salad, hopefully, right? And that binding of audio, video, chat, again, maybe you join in later for a time, that's part of what's creating the space. The boundaries I create using technology and my time, energy, and attention allow specific useful space to exist. But from whence does this space come? How, how does it arise? It's kind of a strange thing to ponder, right? But it's born of space itself. So let's just take a moment to let that settle in and, and think about it a bit here. So what is space for? What is the purpose of space? And it's, it's a few things, right? It's not one thing, right? It's the potential from which all else is drawn. It's where the potential becomes actual and what happens once it does. Space is both where and how you gather things together to make them one thing. This is how things bind, how they're recognized how they operate in the world and become enchanted. Where you put things together for the prediction of the future is the space of the imaginal, where your imagination resides. Space is also where we judge, where the standard exists, where the thing we are judging exists, and where we as agents exist. Now, I have live streams on discernment, judgment, and action. You should check them out. They're rather good. And that's where things exist. All those things. They're all there in space, in the field of potential, if you will. And, and not just in space, because science uses that word, but never really satisfactorily defines it, right? We used to fill it with ether, right? So everything around us was the ether or in the ether or part of the ether. and just couldn't measure the ether, and people were okay with that back in the day. It's probably a better system than we have now. But that was the actual word, ether, to say that space is not empty, because it's where potential manifests. And so it's empty in a sense, right? Because the potential isn't there yet. And so there's room for it. How much room does potential need? I don't know. That's, that's, that's hopefully space is ever expanding or something. But think about it. How else could it be? So by definition, contrary to some popular postmodern idiocy, space is defined 
by boundaries. Without creating boundaries, you do not have space. You have equal oneness with no way to tell one thing from another thing. You want infinite space? You get infinite nothingness. Space is between things as well. That's how things aren't all one thing. The in-between boundaries have space on either side. So you carve up space. It doesn't go away. It just gets moved around. There's space around the thing you manifested. There is no sort of Neoplatonic many in such a boundless hell. That's why you need space between the things. Right? That's how you get the many. The way the alleged Neoplatonist, there's no such thing as Neoplatonism, by the way, um, and there can't be such a category, it's absurd, uh, talk about things, they're really trapped in this dual definition of many. Because the way they lay the world out, it's the one, and then everything else. Uh, but if everything else is smooth and, we'll say, unbounded, uh, then it's not the many. All right, but that's not, the, the problem of the one and the many is not that problem, right? That's the nihilism problem. And then aside from physical boundaries, we'll say, or boundaries as such, space needs to be bounded in time. And all of this sort of begs the question, just how do you make space from space itself? You need to have that interaction with it. And at least as space is defined as potential, right? You add boundaries, time, energy, and attention, directed properly, and voila. Space is what's outside of the boundary, not just inside. Again, when you carve up space, it doesn't go away. There's still space, right? And it helps to define those boundaries and keep that. So it's not outside the boundary, not just inside the boundary. It's space on both sides. And at the same time, space is what bridges the gap between the material and the ethereal. Right? We, we have to have a mechanism for manifesting our dreams, for testing our predictions in our head versus what's happening in the real world, right? A place to observe versus a place to dream. And that's the two aspects of space, but it is the place that we dream in that inspires us and, and that we can aspire to that allows us to carve out the material space w without the ethereal imaginal space. We, we can't manifest physical space. We can't name physical things. The physicality doesn't exist except in contrast. You need contrast to see. But space also bridges that gap between what's in your head and what's in the world. There is a boundary, and you know that boundary by observing yourself by observing what happens in the world as a result of your actions. And that's the problem, is that we're not appreciating space. We're not appreciating its nature, because it's very different from even the, say, the physical or material manifestations, very different from what we're used to, say, the mathematical aspect. Math can sort of map out space, but then there's multiple versions of space in the scientific frame that they don't kind of talk about. They just sort of hand wave over. So you've got to get a handle around that, right? Because space is where the enchanted world is. Space is the thing that allows the enchantment of the world. 
right? It's it's the thing that breaks up the sequence, but also allows the sequence to exist, right? The procedure has space in it. In order to create a procedure, you need to create a space between things so you can describe them in an order. And ordering is very important. I'm going to do a video on ordering someday. It's just talking about ordering and sequence is really hard um, because people just lost the conceptions. And space is one of the things that creates sort of the asymmetry of the world, right? It's not all one milieu of Neoplatonic oneness or whatever, right? There's many things. And we know that because there's space in between those things. However little space there may be is not relevant, but that helps us to determine the boundaries. And so getting to know space, getting to understand space, getting familiar with space is important because it helps you know where you end and other things begin. And one of the interesting things about space is that once you've bounded potential, <clears throat> you put a boundary around it, it changes into an arena for you, fancy Verveki word people. Space is where an agent can act, and it tells that agent something about how to act, right? There's signals. Jordan Peterson talks about this, right? You know you don't belong at the podium, and you know you're supposed to pay attention to the podium because all the chairs are pointed at the podium, right? And there's on and on and on. There's lots of signals in an arena or in a material space. And that's why you can design a space, right? Like, oh, you can design a space with all these signals that point the agents to where they're supposed to go and what they're supposed to do. You do the same in art, right? And they talk about negative space, right? Which is, oh, we've got to, we always talk about how to fill things up. We need to talk about how to, how to contrast them by leaving things out. That's what the negative space conversation boils down to at the end of the day in art. We practice acting in a space with our imagination. And this is, of course, where we can set all of the variables, control all of the rules, and set all of the boundaries. Cheat time, energy, and attention by speeding it up. Right? Things in your head move very quickly. However, when you do that, you are engaging in fantasy. And that's not a bad thing. We need fantasy, right? We need the imaginal realm and the ability to imagine things and our imagination. We need all that. But it remains a fantasy unless and until it is enacted in the potential outside of your head, outside of the imaginal realm. Right? More time, energy, and attention directed, intended, attended, aimed. And that's important because until that happens, we don't have observation, any kind of observation about what it is, how real it is, and how it works. And more importantly, until you do that, until you get it out of your head, other people can't commune with you about it. They can't engage in it. And they can't validate that what space you're creating is real or useful. And when you just keep it in your head, you just don't know what's going on anymore. You you don't you don't have a sense and you can't like it it you can't have a sense you need that independent outside of yourself perspective in order to do that why space is important do i see the same space that you do how close do you stand to a person that's a good question and it's slightly different for different people and different relationships to those people but how do you know if you're standing too close to a person Somebody should tell you. We can make the argument that no one's doing that anymore, and that's part of the problem. I agree. 
But that's why it's important to push back on people's fantasies because it makes them worse, not better, if you don't, right? So we can argue about how to do that. Now, obviously, I'm a fan of the fancy Viveki words and the concept of the agent arena relationship. I find that very helpful. It's very helpful framing, but it's too limiting, right? It's too individualistic unless you realize there are no arenas with a single agent in them. That's not a possible configuration. And no agent is in only one arena. In other words, space requires agents and enables agents and constrains agents. And you should not pretend, unless you are fully in your imagination, that you are alone in space. That is nihilism. And we don't, we don't do that here. Just FYI. We're not, we're not nihilists here. We're, if anything, fighting the nihilism. And again, you won't know about space entirely and solely from your own perspective. That's not possible. So you need to be careful about that and consider that. This is why people have these grandiose dreams of being the next Elon Musk or whatever, and they manifest nothing in the world ever. And they get bitter, and they get resentful, and they get angry, and they turn to socialists reliably, consistently. Kind of weird, unless that's how it works. So the sense of space is important because it also allows us to stop believing in certainty or 100% certainty and gain an appreciation for where miracles come from. Miracles come from space. The infinite potential of miraculous cures or bizarre synchronicities or waking up in the morning and not feeling depressed for no apparent reason. And we can argue about the largeness of miracles. I think that's silly talk. It's important to know where they come from, large or small. That is the enchanted world. The enchanted world is the world where you understand space, where you interact with space properly. And you have to use other people to help you with that. As Pastor Paul says, we outsource our sanity. Huh. It's almost like Distributed cognition is real and required because we're too insufficient to see ourselves, which would necessarily be true. I mean, I can't see me right now. Um, I'd have to look at something that is projecting me on my screen, which I can't because of my notes up. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a limitation. It's a constraint in space. Your eyes cannot pop out of your head and look at you. And even if they could, I'm not sure that would give you the information that you seek about yourself. Might make you take showers more often or something. I don't know. And now we get to the problem, of course, with sharing space or, or rather spaces. The concept of identity becomes multifaceted. The world becomes multi-perspectival. And then everything becomes complex and therefore enchanted. So you can have a shared space or shared spaces. In fact, that's not optional. You, you have a shared space and you have shared spaces and you're not getting around that ever. So get over that. And therefore, you know, you must resolve multiple identities. You don't have a single identity. You never had a single identity. You're never going to have a single identity, and you're no, never going to have had a single identity. That's quite the price to pay 
for being able to do things, like really kind of anything, not that you can do anything, but all of the things you can do are enabled by this multiple identity situation, by having multiple spaces that you can access as an agent and by not being the sole agent in any of those spaces. But I, but I think it's a likely worthwhile price to pay. It's also not optional. So, you know. so there's a, a shared space where you can have things in common and a private space where you can be unique and come up with things or, or you know, manifest things that no one you know of has thought of before. Not bad. But make sure you know the difference and are making the right trade-off there. Which is roughly be alone and have the world exactly the way you want it. Or suffer the enchantment of multiple identities to cooperate and commune with others. Allowing you to build things bigger than just you in both space and time. Making space gains time. So sure, if you're a drug addict, you can do half as many drugs and maybe buy yourself 10 more years of life. Who knows? And that's part of the power of space, right? You, you often hear that wealthy people trade time for money, right? Or they get efficient with their allocation of cash. Right. Oh, efficiency is a slippery subject. I'll be doing a video on that soon. Because it's not what you think. But there are these trade offs between time and space. You can expand and contract time and space, although you're trading one for the other. But that's the power of space. Right. Space from things. And things from space. It's a very reciprocal relationship. And it's how you wrangle the potential into actual. It's part of manifesting reality. Is this deep trade-off between time and space. It's nice to have a place where you do not need to speak. A place to think about things. Those things that would otherwise be muted or lessened or maybe destroyed if you tried to put them into words. That is to say, reduce them to mere propositions. The propositional tyranny, my friends, is real. And it's a big problem. And in that space or place, maybe no signals exist, right? It allows you to contemplate, reflect, and ruminate. Something I've done a past live stream about. Check that one out. It's rather good. Now, you may ask, what good is all this space talk? How do I use this newfound set of conceptions and tools? Space is where you rest and reset. It's not all just building and manifesting and creating and spending time, energy, and attention. You can go there to rest. You can go there to reset yourself, to find out where you were and where you have been. That, to some extent, is what rest is. It's a base state. It gives you contrast. I was working. Now I am resting. I was entertaining myself. Now I am resting. I went from work to entertainment, burned myself out, didn't rest. Not good. Might be something cyclical in there about 
days of rest or something. Don't know. Space is a thing that allows you to think without being assaulted by things trying to attack your attention. Do you ever go for a walk on the beach? Sit and watch the stars. Just sit quietly in your room and reflect. Space is how you train your ability to move more slowly, to find the missing components where everything isn't all about the next part of the procedure. You can make space and then you can give up your enslavement to other things. Hopefully you're giving that up to something higher. That's how you get out of the rat race. You don't want the world to be divided into procedures. It's next procedure, next procedure, next. Pro Even if you put space in between it, you still need a space not only to rest and reset, but also to get out of that proceduralization, to do that contemplation, reflection, and rumination. Where does art come from? It comes from space. It comes from potential. How about music? Same answer. And what is silence? Maybe it's the sound of empty space. If space is in fact empty. And where is it that you participate? I'm not, I'm not asking how you participate. That could be reduced incorrectly to a set of procedures. Where is it that you get along with other people? Where is it that your love resides for others? Where is it that you care? Where do things happen? And how do I know my thoughts better? How do I hone in on my thinking process? How do I know myself better? How do I know myself where I end and other things begin? Where is the space? between me and everything else, or space is. I need to make space to think about these things, to do that work, to contemplate, reflect, and ruminate. And this is part of how you train your attention. As Jonathan Bajot says, the world is attention. And that's the core of relevance realization. So in our fancy Verveki words, we've got relevance realization. How do we train it? By understanding space. Now, I'm not suggesting meditation. I talked about meditation before. It's hard. Most people aren't interested in it. Uh, most people can't do it. It's just not going to happen. I mean, we're all different, right? Uh, but even those who are interested, about half, in my experience, will engage. Uh, and most of them will drop out after a very short time because meditation is really hard. Even if it's directed meditation, which is preferable to trying to do it on your own, which is just going to lead to solipsism and narcissism and evil. Not, not a fan of evil. Still a no on evil. 
But there are lots of other sort of interactions with space that we can have. And prayer might be one for those crazy Christians. But I probably mentioned this before, but what I found is that the people that I find the most wise tend to be people who work with their hands and have a lot of either free time, like they're moving from place to place, uh, or repetitive work. And that's, I'm not saying everybody with those qualities is wise. I'm saying that all the wise people I know uh, seem to be doing physical labor and have sort of downtime on their hands, whether it's through repetitive work or, or travel. And that space for them to think about things where maybe they're driving, you're kind of on automatic. A lot of the time when you drive, Jordan Peterson talks about this. Lots of people talk about this, right? Well, where does that come from? Oh, I don't know. I, I got here without crashing. I can't remember any of the journey. Yeah, but you were doing something, right? And not everybody, but many people are going to be thinking about more philosophical matters, or I would call them religious. Because that space for them to do that is there. There's a mental space that gets created by repetitive work or by just traveling and doing something sort of low involvement where you can just go on autopilot. That creates a space. Some people can fill that space with thinking about thinking, right? Abstracting out. But you have to do that somewhat deliberately. Right? It's not an easy thing. Like, oh, you just like, go for a long drive and suddenly, you know, you'll come up with philosophical questions. No, it's it's not, it's not like that. And you can sort of ritualize it or whatever. And oh, I you know, go for a walk on the beach every morning at eight. And well, that might work, but it's not that simple. Because space is complex. It's not complicated. It's complex. And to Ethan's point, a space for a spirit to dwell. Yeah, and the, the danger is we there is space and the spirits dwell there. And you need to be careful. Always need to be careful. And look, I'm a big fan of meditation. I used to meditate four times a day when I was younger. I can pretty much hop in and out of meditation fairly straightforwardly. And if you want a good meditation, like John Ravinky's meditation series is fantastic. I got to say, just really blew me away. Hard to find. Uh, it Ping me or whatever on my Discord server and I can get you the link. Of course, I got to find it myself because I keep losing it and then rediscovering it. But it's a really good set of lessons for people who are into that and can do it. Meditation, not everybody can do meditation, man. It's hard. But one way to think about meditation is that it's explicitly the exploration of empty space, right? I mean, if you engage not with the Western Buddhist ideas, because Western Buddhists and Alan Watts are just garbage, garbage thinkers who have never talked to an Easterner, clearly. Uh, it's still not an action, right? I mean. Maybe exploration is even the wrong word, right? Because exploring nothingness means doing nothing, right? It means sitting in silence, embracing a lack of movement so that you can sense entropy. So, I mean, you can stop moving, but the world's going to move around you. So did you stop moving? I don't know. Entropy is always a tricky, uh, tricky subject for me, um, for everyone, I think. But when you do that, you now have contrast from the world of constant signals, constant movement, constant stuff. Space has no stuff, no signals, no movement until it is brought into reality by your time, energy, and attention. And I think I shall leave it there.
and we'll go through the comments, which I could only glance at because I'm sick as a dog today. I don't know what's wrong with my stomach. But it's not happy with something. Uh, boring physics stuff. Sorry, Benjamin, not going through boring physics stuff that's not relevant that you actually don't understand well enough to talk about, by the way. So maybe, maybe you should go to school or maybe not. School probably wouldn't teach you good things. Um, John Jackson Grieger. Yes, no diversity without boundaries either. Right. Yeah, you can't talk about diversity and then put everybody in the same category. That that, that obviously doesn't work. Uh, you destroy the diversity. So it is a trick as diversity people are just tricksters. Matthew Parlato. It's why all these pseudo-religious ideologies worshiping propositions fail miserably. These patterns. Yeah, exactly. Well spotted, sir. Well spotted. Um, have inherent opposites. The matter with things. Yeah. The, the binary thinking. I have a video on binary thinking on navigating patterns. Obviously, great video. Uh, the binary thing is just killing this world. It's just absolutely killing this world. Is <laughs> freaking. And I get it. Like most things, you have to have a binary thought about because you're just not smart enough to think about most things. Uh, in fact, you're probably not smart enough to think about all the things you think you know. Uh, it's just a big problem. But yeah, the binary thing just absolutely wrecking everything. No appreciation for the complexity in the world, um, which is part of why I want you to contemplate space, right? Because it does add that complexity back in. That is sort of the point of this. If you wanted to look at the project of reenchantment or look at my channel, uh, Navigating Patterns, is part of the project of reenchantment. Yeah, space is required. Like you're not going to reenchant without a good understanding of space. I think it's one of the things missing in some of these conversations. Um, be interesting to see what the symbolic world folks have to say about it. I'm sure there's one or two watching. Um, and welcome, by the way. John Jackson Grieger, it will spill out weirdly and unconsciously if you keep them in or on, yeah, in your head. Yeah, th see, things spill out of you. And if you don't have the contrast to see the things that are in your head to begin with, that gets real dangerous real fast. Um, that's that's a real problem. And it, and it is a problem that we're having. It's a problem that you see everywhere, right? So things are spilling out of people's heads, left, right, and center. And they're not aware of it. They don't know how much of, of themselves they reveal. You know, I, I'm sort of, sort of uh, always interested in, you know, people on the left tend to think that no one knows their political leanings. Um, and uh, I can always spot somebody with leftist political leanings for whatever reason. And a lot of other people can too. Uh, we're just too polite to kind of point it out to them that no, no, it's the people who are not leftist. Uh, who are harder to spot in terms of leanings. Uh, they tend to have a diversity of ideas on the on the very same issues. Uh, and political frames are garbage anyway. I've talked about that about a billion times. Uh, can't talk about that enough, however, because everyone's still using political frames, which are binary, and binary thinking is bad. I think I went over that already. Uh, but not enough, because people are still doing it. Lazarus, if a ship has a captain, do you entertain a captain of the self? Well, no, you don't have a captain of the self. Uh, the self being understood as plural? No, uh, that's all garbage talk. Uh, something like you see to the soul or... No, this is all garbage talk. Uh, this isn't that hard, right? Like defining self is impossible. So you can just kind of posit that and it's irrelevant because it changes and you can't measure those changes. And so you can't say, what, what is myself? And what was myself last week as compared to you? You can't do any of that work. So what are you doing? Like the way, again, as Pastor Paul says brilliantly, we outsource our sanity. That's why when you throw somebody in solitary confinement, they go insane. This isn't that hard. Like we know this. Like this is 100% observable, reliable, consistent, lots of experiments. Get put in solitary confinement, you go insane. Why? Because you can't find the boundaries of yourself. You can't do that. That's not a thing that you can do. So stop trying. Just don't waste your time, energy, and attention doing things that are never going to be possible and aren't necessary because no one's ever done them before anyway. And we're here, so they must have survived long enough 
it's all good. Like everyone, the point of evolution is the opposite of what the evolutionists seem to get out of it. John Jackson Greger, I have no, no idea how the boundary of the self works. Right. Well, and you can't, and that's okay. You don't need to. Right. I think I like what Ethan said. A place for a spirit to dwell. Yeah, that's what you are. That's your space. You're a spirit that is dwelling in a space. John Jackson Greger. It kind of feels like that. For me, I usually don't notice when I start thinking. You're not supposed to notice when you start thinking. Who's doing the noticing when you're doing the thinking? Do you think you can think twice or think about think? I, this is crazy, right? It just gets into an endless loop and people don't notice, right? They're so caught up in the age of gnosis that they have this desire, this need to know, uh, and it's unnecessary. You, you don't You don't need to know to do. You can act out of ignorance. People do it all the time and be perfectly successful. Whether it's luck or not is not really relevant. Um, and we need to upgrade our types, our ways of knowing, right? Which I have a video on, obviously, on navigating patterns, uh, right? There's two types of knowing and four ways of informing the world. And once you understand that and the fact that obviously the internal stuff is only internal to you, you can map a lot of the world pretty easily without relying on complex, or actually I should say complicated uh, philosophical definitions. You, you throw all that stuff out. It's fine. You just need some Plato, a little bit of Aristotle. Everything will be fine. Everybody after that couldn't get past them anyway. And they knew it. So just throw their garbage out. They'll be fine. Everything will be fine. Lazarus. These ideas of I and self come from Hinduism. No, they don't. I think you need to talk to Hindus. Uh, don't mean to sound too Jungian or occulty. They, they, they are the westernized versions of Eastern thought. It's Western Buddhism. Western Buddhism is not Eastern Buddhism. They're not the same. And that's where we get very confused because we believe some of these people, like Alan Watts, who, you know, look, Alan Watts was sitting in the milieu of California with a bunch of outcasts from the East who had been thrown out of their traditions. Okay, nobody ever mentions this, by the way. You know, saying, oh, I wonder about these Eastern traditions. Let me talk to all these people who were heretics and got thrown out of their traditions and figure out what their traditions are about. Do you, do you see the problem? Do you hear the problem? Do you understand the problem? <laughs> he started with garbage. When you start with garbage, you get garbage. And we've all swallowed it, hook, line, and sinker. There's actually a great talk. I, I can't remember where it is. I'm sure it's linked on my, on my uh, Mark of Wisdom Discord server somewhere uh, about Western Buddhism. So like, I'm not, like, I didn't make this up. <laughs> like, other people have noticed there's such a thing and that it's a problem and that it doesn't match what the East is actually doing. It's not true Buddhism. Uh, the Easterners have a different way of thinking. See the geography of thought. Uh, is that Nisbet? Corey's going to shoot me. Uh, I should remember. I think it's Nisbet. Um, it's a great book. Check with you. That's a great book. Ah, John Jackson Grieger. I meant that I, that I usually don't have to focus on thinking before I think. Right. I think I misunderstood you. Oh, okay. No, no problem. Uh, it's, I'm easy to misunderstand. Don't worry about that. I'm very good at being misunderstood. I'm a professional. Lazarus, Hinduism is not Buddhism. Yeah, well, it's the same milieu of ideas. Uh, yeah. So, the, yeah, I live with Buddhism. You're right about Western Buddhism. The, the thing that puzzles me, I mean, it really does genuinely like bother me, is that do these people not talk to people from the East? Because I did. And I went, hey, this Western Buddhist idea says blah, 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 blah. And they were like, what are you talking about? We don't, that's not Buddhism. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's not Hinduism. I don't know what you're talking about. That's not, right? It's, it's not Tibetan flavors. Of the, on and on and on. It's never right. It's never right. They're like, it's, it's, and it's not even a translation problem. It's a problem of, of actual thinking. Benjamin Franklin, only because this is funny. Help, I'm trapped in samsara. Yes, that is funny. Uh, if you don't know why that's funny, that's okay. But it is a very funny joke. I assure you that. So look, uh, I think I'm I'm through everything.
Uh, so if you'd like to join, please feel free to pop in. We don't have to stick to the topic of space or any related topic. Uh, I mean, I'd prefer to if we can. Uh, I want to make sure everybody's got the point, right? Uh, but um, feel free to jump in and chat. We can chat about space. We can chat about previous live streams, chat about really anything, uh, hopefully. I, I will always try to tie it back to my topic, but you can ignore that if you wish. And if you don't have a Muppet mug, shop.markofwisdom.org. You can buy one. And they come in black too, I think. I don't I don't manage my store anymore, thank goodness. It's way too much stress. Um, but yeah, feel free to hop in and uh we need elucidation on space and the importance of it. I mean, it, it really is about importance. It's not, and it's not just the importance of space, it's the importance of enchantment itself. And uh, oh, I like this question, Lazarus. What is my favorite space? I think right now my favorite space is when I have my swing set up, which right now I do not, uh, overlooking my pond. And I get to just sit there and uh, do a little bit of swinging. I don't, I don't do that nearly enough. But right now, that's my favorite space is just sitting and watching my pond from a swing. Uh, the swing is really important, too. Um, my my previous previous favorite spaces, there were a few views when I lived up in New England and Massachusetts. I had views of Boston. I used to collect views of Boston. <laughs> like I'd take people around. No, no, no. There's different views of the city. You can see it from different angles. Very big on perspective. And I'd take them around to different places. And they're like, what the hell is this? I'm like, yeah, you can see it from the north, from the south, from the east, from the west, right? There's different angles, different elevations. And it's a very different city from, and it's Boston's a small city, it's tiny. Um, but that makes it all the richer, right? Because you, you can see the whole of it from each of these locations. I mean, you're obviously missing parts because there's things in the way. But, you know, it's not like LA. You, you couldn't see all of LA from anywhere. At, at a reasonable resolution. Boston, you can. <laughs> 10 miles away, sometimes five as the crow flies, you can see the whole damn thing. So that was a previous space. And then uh, prior to that was probably, uh, we had a beach house up in Maine, a family beach house. That was one of my favorite spaces, right? Go up to the beach, walk on the beach, collect rocks, sand dollars, whatever. Those were those were sort of favorite spaces. It's a really good question. Thanks. I didn't uh, I didn't think to talk about that at all. And there's spaces inside my head, right, obviously, where I go um, when I can. They they take rather a lot of brain power, I'm afraid. Um, but you know, you want to create a space in your head where you can kind of hang out. You know, you 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 want to have that that sort of interaction too. Welcome. Are you there? BD. Does that stand for something? Hello. Howdy. How's it going? You're a little quiet. Can you turn up your mic a bit? What's going on? Oh, just thought I'd come in and say hello since you were inviting people into the studio. Good to see you. Do you have any comments about space? Hello. Oh, got a question here. Lazarus, have you moved often? No. Uh, no, I lived in Massachusetts most of my time. Yeah, Boston and South Carolina. Yeah, I moved to a new space. Leaving Florida for Texas. What? into a communal space for a little while before getting a place. Oh, interesting. It's good to have a communal space. I I, I did live in a communal space for a while um, and learned a lot about hippies and their evil ways. Dirty, smelly hippies. Not a fan. Um, still love some of those people. But, man, living with disorganized people and people who don't like rules and boundaries and who rebel all the time, very hard to do. What do we got? John Jackson Krieger. I'm actually on the edge of my seat. <laughs> What's up with bro's poster? Good question. What's up with your poster? What's up with my poster? Yeah, the thing behind you. So, so 
see if I can. Ah, it's Rush. Of course it is. There we go. <laughs> You're a Rush fan then. Uh, I am the Rush fan. Every Rush fan I have ever met um, says they are the Rush fan. <laughs> Did you know that about Rush fans? Or, or had you not noticed at the Rush concert, <laughs> which, by the way, I remember fondly. Did, did you did you read um, Getty Lee's My F and Life? Yep, I sure did. I'm not surprised. I listened to it recently. It was quite an interesting book. Yeah, I both read it and listened to it. That doesn't surprise me. Well, I actually ended up listening to it because I the reading of it was going too slow. <laughs> Yeah, well, obviously, I didn't read it because uh, reading just sucks when you're dyslexic. But yeah, I did listen to it. I, be, I did. I listened to it uh, on a trip down to Florida. So. So what's up? Just. Popping in, listening to what you got to say, because I had some time. That's good. Have you been listening to any of my other stuff or? From time to time, only you only really get the chance when the family's out of the house. How is the family, by the way? Uh, family's good. That's good. Are you in Colorado? Yep. Yeah, Denver, that's... Colorado now. Well, Littleton, Colorado. Why Colorado? Mike, what, what brought you out there? Uh, ice skating. Yeah, that the daughter needed uh, better ice skating coaches. <laughs> okay, how's that going? Is she like uh, a champion yet? Uh, no, because she blew her knee out. <gasps> oh no! Oh, that's awful. Yeah, she's getting better. She'll get back. Uh, she'll get back to her activities next month. She All right. Su- she had surgery in June. Oh my goodness, surgery! Oh, yeah. That's awful. I had, to, I had to put things back together again. I gotcha. I gotcha. But, uh, but yeah, uh, I do pop in every once in a while. See what uh, see what's going on. You know, hear, well, hear, that's the, good. Hear, hear the thoughts. You know, hear the thoughts. Yeah, yeah. To, Lots of thoughts. So many thoughts. Try to try to internalize them. Well, that's good. Are you finding it useful or? Yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm in a weird place at the moment, so you know, uh, my mind expanding thoughts are always a, a good thing. <laughs> yeah, things get closed in with the sort of uh, regularity of daily life, right? And then you kind of need. I mean, I think a lot of people that sort of engage in this the space that I that I inhabit to some extent that I'm sort of on the edge of. Uh, that's their thing, right? They've got a family life or they've got, you know, constant video games and Cheetos or whatever, right? And, they, and they're missing that that abstraction, that thinking about thinking, that philosophizing, ugh, which I don't particularly like. Um, but they're, they're missing that interaction, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm missing a lot of interaction these days. Well, that's too bad, man. Why, why is that? It just... Because of the move, or was it before uh, that? Just, uh, I'm, uh, I'm going through some crises. Let's just go call, call it that. Sucks. <laughs> That's awful. Yeah. Well, it's like so crisis cool. always comes, right? So, yeah. and you're never prepared for, you know, whatever it is. I know my, my uncle had an operation this week, and that's been just a disaster. So the whole family is mess because they don't know how to be decent so um yeah it's been back and forth and uh, you know all, all kinds of problems and the medical system is such a mess now that everyone's screwing up everyone's medications or their operations or whatever right you got to keep a, 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 a hox eye view on everything because doctors can't, are screwing up can't even get the medication i need at the moment really oh jeez, nope. that sucks yep. what is it like like uh statins or something stupid or uh um uh, uh diabetes medications 
Oh no, that's even worse. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's my my uncle's having that problem too. That's the one they didn't call in today, apparently. Uh, like, literally, oh. literally, CVS can't even get the medication I need. Huh. I wonder if I wonder if that was an excuse they made for not giving him his medication today. Uh, and it, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's happened too. Um, a lot of people have have told me these little stories about. Oh yeah, and then I went to the doctors, and they said, no, 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 the pharmacy. We we gave the pharmacy everything they needed. Um, so whatever story they told you about us not sending the paperwork along is a lie. And it's like, oh, I've had people like, no, no, go to the doctor's office, grab the paperwork, bring it to the pharmacy. And the pharmacy is like, well, we don't have it. I was like, <laughs> yeah, but when I was here an hour ago, you said the doctor didn't give the orders. So so they're making excuses for supply chain problems or or planning problems or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, not that's not good. Yeah, been through five medications with with an endocrinologist, and every one of them said, "No, we can't get that. No, we can't get that." No, wow, get that. wow, that's awful, man. That's terrible. <laughs> yeah, a lot of things are getting worse, unfortunately. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, ooh! I like this comment, Sally. You're like on top of it today. Philosophy is the veil that shows the shape of things. Yeah. That that idea of veils showing shapes that we got from the Symbolic World Summit, man, that's a very powerful idea. That's that's I like that idea that, that philosophy is wrapped up in uh, in the veil. I like that. Who is this? John, welcome. Hi. <laughs> Can you hear me all right? Is this microphone working? Spot on, sir. Spot okay, on. Okay, cool. It's a new one. So yeah. Hi. Sorry if What's I'm on your like mind. It. Excuse me? What's on your mind? Uh, nothing. Um, just got off work. Um, me and my brother, it's Friday. Um, we don't have work tomorrow. Uh, we might have work Sunday. So, um, just sitting here being nervous, I guess. <laughs> nervous. Welcome to the space. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Welcome to the space. I feel like it's, it's, it's not a safe space, but it is safe in this space. How's that? Um, sure. There could be always repercussions for anything, but <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, like, like this is all just contained, and yeah, not, nothing nerve wracking. So, you're you're kind of new speaking up. Have you been watching for a while, or what's your what's your deal? Yeah, like a few episodes here and there. Probably watched like um, eight or so. I think um, more so, a lot more now. Um, I, you know, actually, when I first got uh, watched the, the first episode of your show, I was going through like a lot of. Um, really crazy personal stuff and so i kind of like dropped out for a bit and then started like oh yeah <laughs> like i found i found this guy while i was like losing my mind and, like yeah and i came back and it's been it's cool so yeah 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 i like the things you have to say so oh good well i'm, I'm glad to hear that yeah I hope doing it's much helpful. Better. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah 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 i never really like, lost my mind completely it was just kind of like the the sort of like standard, like I think the government might be after me, and that coincided with a bunch of like, oh yeah, crazy events that were um, actually happening. You know what I mean? Like I was talking to people, and they were, well, whatever. I want to get into that. But, yeah, no, no. I, you know, I saw that. Uh, shoot, it was probably yesterday. I forget where, but it says somebody talking, and I'm like, oh, you're paranoid. And the guy, <laughs> like, it was clear he didn't know he was paranoid. I'm like, you're just paranoid. Yeah. And it was just like, wow, this is fascinating. He's like online, and he's just being paranoid. I was like, this is so weird to just see people kind of publicly. Because I always make this distinction. I go like, look, it's one thing to think a thing, but it's another thing to say it. And it's another thing to say it publicly, right? Like these oh, are yeah. different levels of, when you, again, and, and this came from a comment on a video I did, you know, probably two years ago now with with uh, Joey on, and uh, Father Eric actually on, on Pastor Paul Vanderclay's channel, right? Where we were talking about, um, about sort of meaning crisis stuff and crisis of faith stuff and, and you know, people who don't go to church and, and things like that and, and the, you know, the differences. And uh, apparently, uh, although I think the comment got erased, there was a comment on there, but somebody says, yeah, you know, talking about where you end and other things begin actually really helps people because they don't seem to know. They don't seem to know, like, that there's differences right and and so you do you don't want to mix your say deep personal oh yeah 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 well you know 
my 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 brother um so maybe it's kind of genetic but he lost his mind a little bit more mm. severely and he, he came back as well um but one of the things that was happening was like he was painting and he thought that his paints were like um well like a, a part of his body essentially and that he was like it was mm. yeah exactly and it was like he was, wow. it was like squeezing out onto the canvas and he really didn't have control over it but it was like you know it, it was it was interesting you know um but yeah, yeah, you know, like really just um, like, I mean, it was kind of just like a, a feedback loop thing. Um, I mean, there was a bunch of weird things going on at the time, like going on at the time. And I was just kind of like stressed. And um, <laughs> at the time I was into like some government conspiracies and like, I didn't think that like, I wasn't, I never thought that anything was going on, but I went like personally to try and investigate something and that very same night, some people who were cartel members started giving me like trouble for no reason. I'm like, oh my God, is the CIA going to like kill me with the cartel? <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. And then like, yeah. then I stopped sleeping because of that. You know what I mean? Right. And then, and, you know, the wake in your dream, it's just, yeah. And then, um, you know, I, I, I decided I need to go to Mexico to be picked up by the Russians. So. <laughs> there you go. That's yeah. funny. Yeah. You get into that vicious cycle. And people, so so let me let me try something on you just because you're new and and I don't really know you, and um, I've been thinking about ways to communicate all this stuff. Like like, it's it's weird for me. I see the world very clearly, and the rest of you seem to like not. It's like, do you not see what's going on? Uh, and, and fair enough, right? the the way The way I've been thinking about it is, there's a flood of information, and we're just drowning. In, in so much data, so many facts, so much information, right? And so that causes us to lose our way, right? And then we get yeah. turned around. And then when things start to make sense again, like you get the synchronicities, that's what Jung would call them, right? Or you get these um, interactions that, that seem connected. Well, right? So what's crazy about that is I, I have never experienced more synchronicities than when I was losing my mind. And so I don't know yeah. if like, and actually, a lot of things that I learned, I learned are, are very true. <laughs> you know, it turned out to be really right. true. And right. I'm almost wondering that if it was like some kind of like like mapping thing going on, because there were constant like weird, crazy synchronicities. And I've never experienced that before. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. But yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, well, well uh, some of it, some of it is over connection for sure. Right? Yeah. And, and some of it is lack of connect. Like if you're not connected to anything, you're just depressed. Well, and actually something that I actually, that I think was a difference between when my brother lost his mind and when I did um, is that I am pretty religious and I, mm. I, 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 I sure to call myself a Christian because like, I'm trying to be a Christian. You know what I mean? Sure, sure. So like, um, but like, so I, I end up getting really obsessed with the idea of sin and like the dream that I was having was like, it was very based along like a crit like but I, yeah i was using the bible to like tell me what to do next and i think that kept everything really grounded and kept me out of trouble because like there was a lot of times where i legitimately could have died like there were times when i was in mexico and the police have assault rifles there and i was like i, I was they were trying to arrest me for no reason you know what i mean and like so i was struggling with them but whatever it just it could have gone wrong <laughs> you know what i mean if i didn't have that grounding you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. of, of that. So it's funny that like, even though I lost my mind, it was like I was skipping and still, you know, not completely mm -hmm. running into something. You know what I mean? The, 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 the dream kind of like petered out almost. It didn't right. even come to ever abrupt end. It was like, even afterwards it ended, there was like months and months and months of accepting that it like, no, that was not real. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was never right. a point where it like crashed. Um, sure. but, but that things mm -hmm. about it were deeply true. But I learned but um, yeah, right. about evil and things, about God and about that God is the only thing that's there when things are really, really bad. It's the only thing that's there. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's interesting. I mean, we, we talk a lot about grounding um, and historical grounding in particular, um, which is sort of my phrase, but uh, the idea of grounding and having a grounding so that when these floods happen, you you know you'll know there is a ground out there and you know maybe you're adrift for a while but you know eventually you you won't be yeah. right and then and then maybe having a grounding a good grounding gives you that intuitive sense so that you can navigate right because yeah. orient and navigate it's a pirate show for a reason right and 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 that helps you without you without you realize it's all this knowing like i want to know myself 
you can't know yourself. It's fine though. You don't need to. It's, it's cool. Like, <laughs> just calm down. Right? It's stressful though. You can control. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm still trying to figure out where I am on Jordan Peterson's personality spectrum. I think I know too much about it to like test myself accurately. And I don't know a lot of this stuff on there. So it's funny. Um, but yeah. Well, you can just, you can just do the, um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the writing course, right? Oh, yeah, that's probably, yeah. Yeah. You don't need to know where you are. You can yeah. just see, see, this is, this is the obsession, right? This is where the relativism actually can come in handy if you use it correctly. Right. Because relativism can be used in a positive fashion. You can say, I want to get better. Then it doesn't matter where you are. Right. So that's very relativistic. It doesn't matter where you are. You can always get better. That's good relativism. <laughs> it's like, oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. hard to know how to get better. That's still a problem in relativism. But yeah. that's the proper place for relativism. because You can't use just relativism to to be in the world like Sam Harris <laughs> tries to do. Right. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. Obviously can't work. Obviously. Yeah. No, um, I mean, if I if I had been because um, I used to be an atheist and if I had yeah. like been that way when I had my break, it would have been bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and you know, I, I think yeah. um, I, I'm, I'm going to use this opportunity to take a little shot at Matt Dilhanty because he annoys me a lot. Please. <laughs> but like, um, you know, when him and Jordan Peterson, there's that famous point where they're talking about Raskolnikov and he's like, atheists aren't like that. And when I was watching that, I was like, yes, they are. Wow. <laughs> and and yeah. looking at that time. You know what I mean? I was living a life of complete, like, trying to rationally put together the perfect pleasure where, like, every day I would, like, mm. soak in my bathtub, like, smoke a blunt, put on my favorite podcast, mm. eat a nice brownie with ice cream. And, like, that was literally the most depressed moments I've ever been in my whole life. <laughs> it was in that time period. But, like, anyways, but, like, at that time, um, this was right out of high school, and there was someone uh, who basically I, – I was dating dating a girl – and um we were both on the lacrosse team together so i guess this was this was st still during high school actually um but anyways he was like ex-girlfriend like nonsense or whatever and he basically put a, a lot of her photos um publicly and showed a lot of people that and at that yeah. time i was actually legitimately plotting to kill him like i wasn't actually i didn't go far 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 with it but like I thought about ways of like how I could legally kill him by like tricking him to break into my house. And I ended up doing something like that to get him fired at, at around that time too. And that's something yeah. I apologize for. And I feel really bad about And like, but yeah, when so he's like, atheists aren't like that. I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that was literally, I read that book. I'm like, that was my, a, my core experience. You know what I mean? And you know, around right. that time when I really, what I realized was so um, powerful about religion. It's like, this is in a sense, I wouldn't say it's the starting point because I think kids are born religious, but like, this is like the first awakening. And then Christianity is the, is, is, is the answer to that. You know what I mean? And yeah. that's why I didn't realize, you know what I mean? Mm. It's like, Oh, like this whole fear and, and these questions people have had, and these are mm. the answers, you know what I mean? And I'm actually not alone. That was like my biggest fear right. at that time when I was an atheist. So I'm like, right. I, am I the only person who realizes what the world is and everyone else has, who has is not here anymore. You know what I mean? And that's going to be my fate as well. You know, it, yeah, I mean, and I, I totally understood like school shooters and things like that. People were like, "Oh, it's drugs." It's like it's not drugs. <laughs> you know, why right. do you think it's drugs? Well, that's, like, have that's, you looked at what, where we are? Like that's where I was thinking. You know, that's like, interesting in the context that I recently moved near Columbine, Colorado. Oh yeah, would you have um, some insight on that? Well, it's it's the the that whole Columbine thing still heavily affects the area. Like there's like zero tolerance for any poor behavior in schools around here. Yeah. Wow. What, 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 did, what did you think when it happened? Like, how did you? Well, I wasn't, I wasn't living here then, but you know, now that Columbine high school is within a 10 minute drive of where I live now. Oh, wow. uh, you know, when I go to the bookstore, I literally have to drive right by Columbine high school to get there. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, and it's uh, it still heavily affects this area. I mean, there's like yeah. this, like I was saying, there's zero tolerance for any kind of poor behavior in the schools here. Wow, that's that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I remember. Oh yeah, I like the way Jordan Peterson talks about it. He's like, you know, he's like, have you read their diaries? Because it's kind of <laughs> clear, right? And and I, yeah. you know, I knew when it happened. I was like, yeah. I don't yeah, yeah, yeah. Here. 
Right. But, but that, that to me, like those kids are the perfect example of the materially affluent, right? Affluent people, but spiritually bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And, and that I would say that's one of the sort of the deficits is that people aren't accounting for that that yeah. demographic if you yeah. if you want to you want to frame it that way <laughs> yeah really yeah it's like they don't even, they don't realize it and it's funny because I talked to my dad and he I don't even know like what my dad necessarily believes because he's like he's a very very smart person he's a Christian but he like, doesn't seem to like talk about faith mm. or you know and honestly has a lot of negative things to say about Christianity all the time. And I'm like, yeah. I don't actually know what he thinks. You know what I mean? Wow. Like, I don't know. It's so, it's just, it's, he's like, just like unaware that. But that's a central, felt like such a central problem for me. And it's like, he's just not unaware right. that it exists. I'm like, I'm so actually still kind of confused how that happens. But, but, but that, that, see, that to me is this live hidden Christian thing. That's like part of the problem is that people aren't talking about what they believe. And so who's filling that space? If you want yeah. to bring it back to space, the, 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 the atheists are filling it with this th thing that they call philosophy, which I would They're say necessary, is not, right? It's no. not, well, it's not philosophy, first of all. It's just not. It, it's, it, most of it's gobbledygook. Everything past Plato and Aristotle is junk. Just throw it out. I mean, any of it. Right. I mean, I mean Nietzsche, Nietzsche hinted it. He couldn't get past Plato. Uh, but Heidegger, for example, said, wrote down, I can't get past Plato. Yeah, okay. Well, maybe stop trying, dude. Like maybe you're just not smart enough, and it's fine. I got my first maybe, Plato book recently, so we're, we're maybe working through that. maybe Plato's the smartest guy I ever lived, and you're never gonna be smarter than him. It's fine. It's okay. It's cool. He wrote I'm all that on for you, right? So you know, and and then of course we misunderstand it. I get my video on the lies of Plato's cave, which doesn't have near enough views. I really thought I was gonna break a thousand with that one. I did not. I, I saw that one. Right. Well, yeah. I just and somebody's uh, people are commenting on it left, not not on my video, but on Plato's Cave, left, right, and center. It's two days ago on Twitter. I'm like, I don't know wh what you read, okay? But I read it, and that ain't what it says. Like, I don't know what else to tell you. Like, you you read into this something that was not there. You need to go back and read Book Seven again, and just understand it better because it, it's completely wrong. Like, I don't know what to tell you. It's not some individualistic story. It's exact opposite. It's the exact opposite of an individualistic story. So it's just when we misunderstand these things or we think we can know them, right? It's age of gnosis, that I, as I like to call it. Th then we start to misunderstand the whole world. And no wonder why we're depressed and angry and resentful and everybody wants, you know, everybody wants the government to fix something or, or corporations to stop being corporations or, or money to stop working the way it works under capitalism or, or, or whatever. Yeah. Right. That's a curious problem. I, do you, do you, are you ever worried about corporations getting too big? I don't mean to change it to, to like a conversation to a lower level, but like, I don't know. Yeah. No, that's not a lower level. No, okay. no. So if you, you know, and I'll, I'll I am going to expand it a little bit just because space, I can do this with space pretty easily. If you think of the space of corporations and the space of government, and they're definitely in competition, right? Because they're abstract groups of people, right? And they have very different goals. And, and corporation goal is not always to make more money. In fact, it's almost never that. Sometimes it is. Those are evil corporations, guaranteed. But if you look at it that way, okay, so there's competition between these different groups. And, and maybe religion is a similar sort of thing, right? Like, okay, yeah. Yeah. Right, those yeah. people get together and they're forming organizations that do things in the world. Okay, right, they all yeah. have that in One's common. Inside of the other, yeah. right? Which, well, what are you? I don't, I don't want to get right. into the hierarchy yeah. question. Uh, well, well, we'll slide that aside. We just kind of avoid that. Okay. Right? Right. We'll, we'll let that sit. You can think okay. about that on your own time. Right. But, okay. But if you look back in history, and I am going to go over this. I think I've mentioned it before in some of my videos with Adam, for example. But he, and we're going to mention we're going to do a video tomorrow actually with Adam and record one with him on echoes of the past. Um, the East India Corporation was far larger than any three or five corporations combined we have today. Like it was just big. It was, it, so it was big, bigger it was bigger than so the GDP of most countries at that time. It was bigger in in GDP and in army size to any country. I think <laughs> Wait, what? Being China. it was huge. <laughs> we can't even imagine it. Right. And so people are like, man, we have a real problem with corporations infiltrating government. And I'm like, dude, uh, no, we don't. It's way better than it used to be, <laughs> you know, and, and and that changed over time. So you like and this is the problem. Like we tend to think like, oh, everything works the way it works now. But, you know, with less technology or, you know, with less sophistication or less knowledge or something. But that's not true. Things develop. Right. They actually 
I don't want to say progress. That's a terrible word. No, I got you all another terrible word. But they change over time, yeah. right? And so back then, corporations were much more in the government sphere because, yeah, East Indian Corporation had an army. It had, a, it had a military. It had a military bigger than England. Wait. Why? For to protect their property? Well, because they were doing trade. things. And they were just, right, they were a trading company. And they needed to trade. And when you go into areas to extract resources, which, you know. Okay. You can, oh, okay. Can, I guess that, that makes sense. That makes sense. You can yeah. accuse the British Empire fairly. I'm not, not saying they're all good guys or we're all good guys of extracting resources. But actually, the corporations were the ones that did most of the, not all of it, most of the crime, right? And in the same way, you can do that in the U.S. You can say, you know, the, the American government went out and like really screwed over the Native Americans, especially in the West, in, say, the latter half of the expansion of the country. That definitely happened. They did it for the benefit of corporations and individual homesteaders, though. Right. So it's not, you know, it's not this easy thing like government bad and yeah, nobody else benefited. Well, the, the, the people wanted that at the time too. <laughs> so. They needed it. They needed it. I mean, you know, the, 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 the problem with all this stuff is that most people just don't know the history. Like, like you can look at the history and go, you can say silly things like, well, the Native Americans didn't believe in land ownership. It's like, that's garbage. They had contracts. If you have contracts, you, you have to have land ownership. The two go together, right? And and if you go anywhere in the U.S., you study any U.S. history, like up the street, it's not really up the street, but uh, north of me in South Carolina, this place called Fort Mill. And you go to Fort Mill and you read the little sign and it says, the Indians gave this land to this man because he helped them fight their yeah. Their other tribes. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah That's yeah, what yeah. he did. So yeah. they gave him the land. Obviously, they had a sense of land ownership. Come on. And yeah. then, and then oh, you, everyone does. Right. I, yeah. Animals it's cool. do. <laughs> and, you, and you can go back. You can go back further and you can say, all right, well, you know, um, who, who was engaging with, um, you know, with the colonists? The colonists sort of came in and the first two co uh, colonies got wiped out by the Indians, guys wiped out by the native americans right and they were not in native american spaces as near as anybody can tell right and maybe maybe uh, uh maybe maybe virginia dare uh, you know lived and got integrated in the indian colony but like that colony got wiped out right so it, it's it's kind of the third or, or maybe the fourth colony attempt that that's successful and it's because the native americans wanted them in plymouth because plymouth was empty due to disease right. they didn't bring the disease not that they didn't bring disease Everybody brings disease. Sorry, you're just stuck with the fact that you, you're a diseased, dirty little human like the rest of us, right? But the, it, the smallpox epidemic had already wiped out that village. So it's not like the people from the Mayflower brought smallpox and wiped out the village. That had already happened, right? So we, and then the first, it, nobody knows, it's King Philip's War, the first American Indian War. Who broke what treaty first, right? Nobody knows this stuff. They just don't know the history. So they have these very poor images of the past. It's this idea of corporations, a lot of the corporations formed a lot of colonies for the empire, right? And but back then, those corporations were 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 set up by or at least supported by the king, right? So so you look at at at, at the whole enterprise of the discovery of the new world, like that's all. A corporation that's set up and funded by the king and queen, effectively, right? Like that's where Columbus gets it from. And so all of this stuff is kind of tied up together, right? So, so you know, and, and, and that's not to say that like Google and and Apple and those companies are not in bed with the government too much, probably, um, yeah. but it's not well, that bad. Honestly, I'm, I'm just thinking how much less money they would have if they didn't have like. I'm, there's a lot of stuff I don't know. Like, by the way, the whole time you were talking, I'm like, I'm, you were just constantly teaching me things. I still so like, oh, good. Um, not, not the whole, I know, I know some stuff. I have like very rough pictures of history. Um, but I, I guess I'm wondering how much, if, if we just got rid of our data or got rid of their right to own our data, and made our data our own right, um, would that just take away a lot of money? You know what I mean? Would, would that just shrink them down enough I don't in know. size? Yeah, I don't. Idea? I don't, I mean, part of the problem with money is that 
without corporations, you don't have any money either. So it's actually not a competition because value is, is only in the movement of money. And so it's not like the corporations acquire all the money and then they yeah. have it all and you're, and you lose it all. That's not. That no, no, no. Matter. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not thinking that at all. Um, I love Thomas Sowell. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about like, um, like maybe they have more money than they should have if they're profiting off something that's actually mine and not theirs. And if they have like an outsized body that's outside of their competence, <laughs> you know what I mean? If they're, if, if, if you know what I mean? I'm not yeah. sure if that exactly connects, but maybe that could be that's sort of fair. the problem. You know what I mean? So I don't know. That's, that's fair. I don't, I don't think so. I don't know how you determine okay. that. I don't know. Like, how do you determine too much? So, so I just, I I'll mean, tell I, you, I, 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 I'll tell you, I'll tell you a personal, a, a personal story, right? Oh, Bill is back. Okay. Um, so, so I thought that if I had, yeah, about a million five, um, that I, that I'd be okay. You know, living down here in particular, because it's very cheap in South Carolina compared to Massachusetts. It's not even, it's not even the same uh, universe. It's so cheap down here. It's ridiculous. Um, and it just turned out that I got at least a million five stolen from me from various places uh, with government cooperation so far. Uh, so, you know, and, and it's not the corporations. The bill, a million billion dollar corporations are stealing from you. The people stealing from you are millionaires or tens of millionaires. Those are the people you have to watch out for. And you do. Like, you really need to watch out for those people. Uh, wealthy lawyers, they'll steal your money for sure, right? Um, uh, we wealthy people with lawyers, they'll steal your money and the lawyers will be complicit without knowing it. Uh, right. And, you know, you, you can look back and you say, look, Mark, you know, your house, cause I, I had that, that story of my house, right. On, on my domicile video there. Um, you could say, yeah, your house was taken by Deutsche Bank and that's Deutsche Bank enabled the taking of my house. They didn't, they never took possession of the house. The lawyer did. The lawyer that was working for them took possession of the house for various good reasons, by the way. I mean, Good if you're evil and you're a thief and you're in cooperation with the government. Uh, not good as in goodness, because obviously there's nothing good about stealing my property from me. Okay, so how much money did I need to earn in my life? Because And this is a question that comes up for me now. I'm like, you know, shit, dude, you could have done a, a few more, you know, uncomfortable things and earned three to five million, you know, I'm as of 10 years ago. Pretty easily. Like, I... I, there was no ceiling on the amount of money I could I could have earned. I was just lazy, and I was in Boston, and I didn't give a shit. And I'd get ten job offers a week and turn them all down and stay where I was at, or or you know what whatever, right? And 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 I got sick, so that that wasn't good. Uh, that that really hampered things. But at the end of the day, had I amassed more capital, it's possible, although maybe not, that I would have some left. And so. That, that begs the question, well, how much is enough? Like, how much does a corporation need? How much does a government need? How much does a person need? Like, yeah, I don't know. Like, don't need, people are like, right? oh, these people are greedy. They have too much money. I'm like, how the hell do you know that they have too much money? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that, that's, you're right. I don't, I'm, I don't know that they have too much money. I, I guess maybe I'm saying that the fact that they're profiting off something that might, I don't know. I don't know if I, if, if my data is mine or not. I'm saying if it is my data, that would mean that by definition, they're bigger than they're, than they should, than they're supposed to be. You know what I mean? But a corporation is supposed to be bigger than an individual because it's made up of individuals. Right. And then Sorry, of course, a corporation, a corporation is a body of individuals. So yeah, it's bigger yeah, yeah. than an individual. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah. But for them to have the data of an individual, I mean, maybe that's okay. I, I can I can tell you right off the bat, whatever they're doing with your data, they're doing it poorly. Don't worry about it. Like they're so incompetent, it, it's really not an issue. My I mean, I've are consulted for a lot of these. Things. Yeah, I I've been in a lot of these places. In you know, I've talked to a lot of these quote top end engineers and stuff, and it, most of them are so ridiculously. And, and it's not even the individuals necessarily that are incompetent, but like systems tend to be limited by the lowest common denominator. So the dumbest person at the company tends to bring everybody else down yeah. and usually way down. And so most of the things that happen, 
you know, they're they're active. They, like, yeah, I don't know if you know this, but Microsoft uh, uh, leaked something like six petabytes of data because they were doing something in AI in the cloud and they didn't secure the cloud correctly because how would an AI engineer know how to secure a cloud? They wouldn't, right? They, they should have hired me for that. I could have done it, right? But they lost all that data. Now, um, it got copied or most of it got copied or something. And, and they did eventually find it. But they didn't find it right away. Um, I, I, you know, that's incompetence to some extent, right? That's just people giving people the keys to things they can't handle, you know, and that's tied up in this meaning crisis stuff for sure, right? Like people think they can do things that they, you can't do that. Like you think you can educate yourself into being a good software engineer. You can't. There's just base level software engineering skills that you need to do good software engineering. And maybe you can do scripting you, you've or- You've got to be or, born with that. Right. Well, maybe and some people I think don't have to be born with it, but they can educate themselves. But I think the number is just really small. Like I think we're talking about less than 10% of the population. I don't think we're talking about a large number of people that either are born into it or could educate or be educated into it. I, I just don't think that's the, it's not what I see. Jordan Peterson talks about the Pareto principle. So does Nassim Taleb, right? The Pareto principle is real, man. And it's, everywhere it seems to govern everything around us like the distribution of stars in the universe like it 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 just seems to be at all scales and if that's true the number of good software engineers is tiny and what are the rest of these people doing i don't know <laughs> well if you engineer uh, some software can't you just sell it limitlessly so maybe is are they all buying from the same fella I don't no, know. I, look the problem the problem with with software engineering is you know look I can write software all day long, um, but can I write good software that that say end users who don't know me could use easily? Oh, okay. I can, but I never have because I have no interest in doing that. Um, you know, where does that put me on the awesome software engineer scale? I don't know. I don't care. Uh, you know, I, I don't think I'm the world's best software engineer. I, I never did, uh, right? And I I'm not interested in being that. I never was. Uh, interested in being that, but some people can do that. I can point you at people who have done that, uh, but there's only a handful of them, and I do mean like five. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like it's not it's not a big number. Um, so th then, okay, well then you have to cooperate with other people. Maybe you know, maybe you need a good UI engineer and a good backend engineer and, and a good mid level engineer to do you know some of the glue code or whatever, right? And then maybe you need a really good like algorithm. Well, now we're in a corporation already. Right, like however you want to think of it, like we're in a body, right, with multiple individuals, and then, you know, how's that all going to fit together? Well, it just turns out that everyone makes mistakes, everyone's imperfect, and everyone sucks, and they'll hold on to their sucky thing, you know, like I'm sure I do it all the time, right? Uh, that's why I have Manuel around because he just yells at me when I'm wrong. So it's fantastic, <laughs> you know, and so the product is never good, right? But sometimes it's good enough and most businesses fail because most businesses can't make a product good enough, but sometimes it's good enough. And so a lot of what you see is good enough, but it, does it work as perfectly as you envision? So, so for example, my YouTube channel is not monetized for ads right now. I don't know why, because in one report that you look at in YouTube studio, this is all Google stuff. Like I don't, I don't have any magical tools. I could write them, but I'm not gonna, right? I should be monetized. I should have 4,000 view hours. For four days now, I, sh I should be ad monetized on the channel. And I'm not. And then I go to the earn tab, which I had never thought to do before because like, wh why would you need more than one source of the truth? But apparently yeah. at Google, they don't have that concept. This isn't a surprise to me. I've worked for lots of software companies and places building software. And the first thing I ask them is, where's your single source of the truth? And they go, huh? What is that? I didn't even know the concept, right? So Google obviously even, like, clearly, even places that claim to have a single source of truth have more than one source of truth. Yeah. Right, right. Well, that's the second question. Where, where is it and can I validate it? So when you look at the earn tab, I'm like, I don't know. I think it's I think I looked today. It was 13 hours, view hours short of ad monetization. Why I don't know. It only updates apparently once a day. It seems that way to me. I can't really tell, but that's what it looks like. I don't know what the hell's going on. These guys are clearly incompetent. Like yeah. they just do not know what they're doing at YouTube. Uh, I wish yeah. it weren't that way. Uh, Twitter, 
I downloaded my Twitter archives because I wanted to grab all my Age of Gnosis tweets because I want to write some articles on Age of Gnosis. And to some extent, I'm being held up by this because I need I need all those notes in Twitter. And I yeah. thought I could get them easily. And I've been spending months trying to get them. And it's damn near impossible because their APIs don't work. And there's lots of reasons. I download the archives. They hand me the archives in two files. I unzip the archives. They're websites. I'm like, why would you put this data in a website? This is dumb. Whatever. Fine. I'll deal with it. I open the website and it says, you can't open this website because it's more than 50 gigs of data. And I'm like, how the hell do I have 50 gigs of data on Twitter? Well, this live stream and all the other ones are part of that. Okay, fair, fair. So I'm like, all right, I'm a smart guy. I'll go in and look for the data. Well, it doesn't look like they've given me any of my tweets. It looks like the entire archive was just some live streams, which is fine. And it's under Periscope Media because that's they... They bought Periscope some time back, I think, and that's what they integrated in Twitter. They haven't changed the names. This doesn't surprise me, right? I did this professionally for well over 30 years. This is typical for corporations, especially large ones. So, so then I'm like, well, whatever. Let me just see if I can open the archive. So what I'll do is I'll delete the data. I'll copy it because I want my live stream to do it. And I'll delete it. And then it won't be 50 gigs anymore. And we'll see what they think they have left. It doesn't work. So whatever they're using in the JavaScript has a hard code somewhere that it's not actually looking at the size of the archive. It, it was hard coded when the archive was built. So they built the archive wrong. They hard coded the number and, and they didn't put the data in as near as I can tell. Maybe it's there, but I don't, I'm real suspicious that any of it's there. How many mistakes is that? Like how many <laughs> does it take to, so that's Twitter. Yeah. And that's not the only problem with Twitter. I'm waiting for, been waiting to be monetized on Twitter for like, I don't know, four months, five months. And I'm just stuck in review hell and I've tweeted at them and no response. And you can't contact. Like, it's a disaster. It's a flat pack disaster. And, and you know, like, and you're worried about them? like coming to get you really? no i'm worried that they're incompetent and have a lot of power <laughs> no, but, um, but what, what, what do you think about um like what about what do you think about like the stuff maybe we're talking about something else but like the stories about like pregnant women um getting learning that they're pregnant from the ads that they're getting because i've had stuff like that where like i started drinking coffee and then suddenly i get ads for like diabetes and I'm like, oh, you know what I mean? I don't know if that's how accurate that is, but I'm, I don't know if that's... No, no, it can it can be. That happens all the time. But like, all I would say is people do that constantly. Okay. Like like Sally Joe does this to me. Occasionally she'll remember to actually tell me, but but often she'll be like, oh yeah, you've been, you've been, you haven't been sounding well for three days. And I'm like, is, what? Why didn't you tell me that? And she's like, because it's, it's Sally, right? She's like, I did. And she goes, Oh, no, wait, I didn't. I asked you how you were feeling. And I'm like, well, that's not telling me that I don't sound well. That's kind of the opposite. Like, what is wrong with you? Um, and we joke about this all the time because uh, it's just that's the way Sally is. Um, what People see different patterns. And those are patterns. It's navigating patterns, man. Like, yeah, people navigate patterns. Computers can navigate and see patterns that people can't see. That's actually, I mean, I, I did a lot of data science for, you know, a good 15, 20 years. D data science patterns, like they're everywhere. They're, it's great. And you can make, computers can build patterns and find patterns. And you don't need AI for any of that, by the way. In fact, if you use AI, it's actually worse. Um, the regular machine learning stuff for pattern recognition, amazing, amazing stuff. You can do really cool things with it. You find patterns all over the place. So the, so the question is, you know, the, the more interesting question in my mind is some people see these patterns the way the computers see them. And is it the same? Are they using the same cues? Like, would would people who could see your shopping habits uh, know more about you if they could if they could see it? You know, would they come to the conclusion quicker? Like, that's more fascinating to me. Um, right? is, because because there's something there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that that would be interesting. I don't know. <laughs> I did, John. I I wanted to switch real quick. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Bill, you mentioned uh, Neil Stevenson and East India Company. Uh, do you want to expound upon that? Because I'm I I remember some of uh you know some of Snow Crash and stuff and some of the other stuff. I, I don't think I've finished any of his other books because. Well, it's uh, the the major references I, I'm making there are um, well. Two of his, 
Well, one of his series and then one of his standalone books, because I don't count it as a series. There is a second book in the series, but it was written by an entirely different author. So the hell with that. Um, <laughs> uh, but in the in his Baroque cycle, so it's like System of the World and uh, I forget the other titles uh, off the top of my head. But that, I mean, in the time space it actually takes place in, um, it it involves the East India Company very deeply. Uh, and he does a lot of research into writing his books. Um, so, you know, he somewhat fictionalizes it, obviously, because, you know, he's writing books for entertainment, not for education. But reading his books can be a, an education. Um, you know, it, it, if you're the, the type like myself who sets off and goes, okay, well, what's the truth of this? Um, you know, let me go explore what, you know, he's really talking about here. You know, that, you know, he's very spot on about how the East India Company really, I mean, it was the monetary, you know, system of the British Empire. I mean, without without the East India Company, the British Empire would have never become what the British Empire was going to, well, the East India Company and the British Navy. I mean, the combination of those two is what made the British, the, the British Empire become what the British Empire was. Um, I mean, the East India Company essentially is, is what helped found America. Without yeah, the East yeah. India Company, the colonies would have never existed. Um, but he also goes uh, deeply into some of the involvement of the East India Company in his book, The uh, Rise and Fall of Dodo. Uh, which is another really, it's a really, really good book. He wrote it with uh, uh, a co-author who's the person who wrote the second book. Um, but the second book is nowhere near as good because he didn't have any influence on it. Or his influence was so minimal that, you know, he's not, you know, credited in, in uh, on the book. Um, but he, again, because it's a, it's a book about time travel and the, uh, the people in there have to interact with the East India, India Company. Uh, in that time travel, um, you know, it uh, it's, it's another, you know, great insight into what's going on with the East India Company. Um, and at the same, it's interesting because at the same time, because of some of, I forget the exact reference in one of the books or even which book it was, but, you know, he actually talks about Guinness and, you know, Guinness wouldn't have become as big a beer company as they were without the East India Company. It was East India Company that spread Guinness beer all over the world mm. <laughs> after it was founded. Um, um, and actually, I forgot there are some other references in his other book, Cryptonomicon, uh, mm. which is I mean, it's sort of it's sort of tangential to the Baroque cycle. It has some overlapping characters and stuff. Um, but same thing. I mean, the references in there, you know, again, somewhat fictionalized. I mean, make it pretty clear. You know that uh, how deeply embedded corporation into the world monetary system. I mean, that's kind of what the the, the one book in that in that uh, series called "System of the World." I mean, what he's talking about really is the East India Company was the system of the world. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, a lot of so, people. Yeah, don't... that's what I was referring to. Yeah, I gotcha. A lot of people don't realize that involvement. I mean. In the in the um, you know, we were talking about the the English Revolution uh, when I was talking with Adam about that on, in that video on on, on my channel, the, you know, we, we were pointing out that basically Parliament is the product of the support of the East India Company, uh, right? And so the first revolution when, when that breaks everything. In fact, the English Revolution breaks everything when they when they kill the king. It just destroys the world. Um, that that's the East India Company is wrapped up in that pretty heavily, and and pretty influentially, um, and 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 they're the ones that effectively caused the uh, the revolution, uh, the American Revolution or, or rebellion, probably a better word, um, because they're the ones that profit and they steal that profit from the colonies. The like colonies just basically they can't ship anything. They have no roads. A lot of people don't know that roads were illegal. Effectively, they were illegal. Um, <laughs> they were illegal, and shipping was forbidden. 
Uh, but we had all the shipwrights because we had all the lumber in Maine. Like roads between towns? Yep. Okay. Whoa. Yep. Yeah, well, I mean, why didn't we build roads between towns? Because England basically forbade it. So there's a big I, history. Oh, yeah, this is super obscure. I have some obscure book about it that I, I've read most of, but not all of. But, yeah, it just turns out that, yeah, all shipping had to be done by a British-owned and operated ship. That was part of the charter for the colonies. And the colonies didn't really care until the taxes got ridiculous. And some people have derided this, uh, the rest of history crew, who apparently Oxford doesn't know any history, or at least lies about it knowingly. Um, they're like, oh, it, it was just because, you know, suddenly documents were being taxed. It's like, no, 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 you're not looking at the economics of this situation. And like the taxes went up on everything. But in order to get anything between colonies, it had to be taxed all of a sudden. And that wasn't the case before. This is yeah. a big deal economically for the colonies. It basically would wipe them out had they adhered to it. And you can argue, well, taxes were sparsely enforced and all that nonsense. And fair enough. But they were like, no, nah, we don't we don't want we don't want the influence of the East India Company to determine our fate as colonies. Yeah. And that's really what drives a lot of that. And then we have a thesis in there about why why we were successful while well, the French and the Russians and the and the English revolutions kind of were disasters. Uh, we're the only successful. <laughs> right. But, but, but to the point of, say, corporate involvement in the monetary system, I mean, the monetary system, I, I so I have this thesis, could, could be totally wrong, right, that, that when you have a statement like render unto Caesar, right, uh, you create a third category. Right. So you have, you have kind of like the state and you have like the, the beliefs of the people, the religious beliefs. Right. When you split those apart with render unto Caesar, because before that they weren't right. Like you go to Egypt and like the God and the Pharaoh are kind of the same entity, at least as represented in the material frame. Right. Like that's a long tradition that happened, you know, before Egypt or you know, yeah, yeah. alongside Egypt, however you want to do the time frames. For, for which civilization is older, right? That was the standard fare in history for a very long thousands of years, basically, right? And then you've got this event which rendered into Caesar. Well, what that creates, in my mind, is capitalism. That creates the free flow of money independent of the state or the religion, right? So now you have the, you, you, because, because what happens after that is the rise of the merchant class. The merchant, what is the merchant, you know? Like, because right, right? in Rome, it was it was all the same. Like if you became a wealthy enough merchant, you, you could just be part of the government. Oh. So it wasn't a separate. <laughs> right. It would because because money was was just controlled by the government. Yeah. Right? Well, spread, to, was, spread to England. I mean, you could just buy your way into parliament. Same thing. Right. Right. Well, that was. Yeah. Once you had parliament, uh, that was that was after after it broke. Yeah. But parliament used to be a rare <laughs> a rare occurrence uh, when it became a permanent fixture because the East India Company is, you know, did this interference, that then it becomes a problem. Uh, that that's that's what we're talking about with our English Revolution video was yeah that's that's when everything got broken. Um, but but, uh, but if you look historically, what you find is this relationship. So you know where did the central bank in the United States come from? Well, that's from J.P. Morgan, like actually the guy, like J.P. Morgan, the the wealthy guy. And he interfered in the government uh, monetary system twice, actually. And from that emerges the central bank, right? Because you, you, you need something like that. We can argue about how well it's implemented and things like that all day long. And I'm, I'm happy to do that because I'd shoot them all and jail them for treason. But um, in that order, I'd shoot them and jail their dead bodies for treason. Uh, that's just what, you know, like, I, yeah, the stuff they're doing now is way out way out there like yeah. way out there clearly i'm mean, going to stealing, stealing from people <laughs> but but you need something like a central bank and it needs to be separate from the government so how do you deal with that that's a good question like that's a hard thing like this is actually a hard thing everybody thinks like, it's easy you you can just you can just shoot them and jail them but like that wouldn't solve the problem you're gonna replace it with something right you can't you know you can't that can't be the end of the story that might be the first step uh, right, it might might be a so good create one. a vacuum. Somebody's going to step into the vacuum. Right. Why? Right. Why, it why, work. why does it need to have? Um, why does it need to be centralized? Like, like what, 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 what needs? What, why is it? Why is that important? Well, we had a decentralized system, say before the Civil War, for example. 
right? But then you have six different types of money or more, right? Or one for each state, or maybe two, two in 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 the same state. And it gets very hard to track what's going on. And then what happens is that just leads to lots of fraud. And it's very hard to track the fraud. Do you think people would naturally agree on one over, over time? You know what I mean? Well, they didn't. Like we already have the answer to that. They didn't. They didn't. That's why governments tend to centralize currencies. Okay. okay. Right. But but then but then you don't want the politicians alone to be in charge of that, right? You want a check and balance system, roughly speaking. And in you know in we'll call it modern times, so although it's bad 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 frame. Recent times, uh, right? We have things like central banking systems. So the economics of the situation. Uh, you know, even just after the revolution, right? After the after our revolution, man, the American Revolution, a lot of people end up in debtor's prison. Well, what the hell even is debtor's prison? What a weird concept, right? And it's basically ransom, right? Like you you put people in jail until their family pays their debts for them. Right. And like, wait, that's kind of weird. Like we don't do that anymore. Which is kind of strange, right? Like we don't like why? What you know, I, I'm not going to fall if debtors' prisons are good or debtors' prisons are bad. I'm just saying something changed. That's strange, right? And then, again, you see this with the J.P. Morgan bails out the government. Why? Because we went through a war and the economy was unstable and the politicians were overspending and nobody could track it. And somebody had to bail the government out by injecting cash from an outside source. Well, it just so happens that J.P. Morgan's father was like the largest banker in France or something crazy. So he was like the European banker. Like his, he came from mega wealth already uh, and then arguably controlled more money than anyone in the world at the time, uh, even more than, than John Rockefeller, who was the wealthiest man who ever lived by far, way more wealthy than the top five wealthy people today combined, right? <laughs> Nobody knows this, right? And so what, what ends up happening is he is the only one that can, that has the resources to get together the people to bail out the U.S. government. And, but then he gets to dictate some of the monetary policy, right? Because somebody has to do it. Like you can't, you can't just elect politicians and let them run wild. We know that. I mean, that's why we have a, a checks and balances system to begin with. And we're just adding checks and balances systems. And, and this theme is everywhere, right? Like you see it in uh, in uh, Stargate SG-1, right? Where they, in, in, in Stargate, they have a civilian um, system sort of fighting for control over the Stargate. Like where the they, IOC. Right. Well, they, they've got a bunch of them ultimately, right? But they, they end up getting a civilian. We, we need a civilian system to check, to put the military in check. Like this is a very common pattern that you see. You see it in, you see it everywhere, but you see it in the real world too. Okay. So, so what is, what is, is that, right? Huh? It's that. It's, it's independent, non-government. Not, so they're not political, right? And they're not religious people watching over the money supply. So how does like Keynesian economics fit into this? Uh, well, that depends. Are you talking about what Keynes actually wrote or what everybody thinks he did, he wrote about? Because those are two entirely different things. I, I have no idea. I can't. <laughs> I don't know what I'm asking. Yeah, true True. Keynesian economics has never been tried. I think that's what I would say. Um, Sorry. Unironically. I, I mean, look, Keynes was an idiot. A lot of what he said was right. A lot of the interpretations of his work are just stupid. And they either didn't read him or didn't understand what he was saying. Um, you know, Hayek was not wrong, right? But but all like they didn't disagree as much as people th say, right? And so you, you, and and I think I think like Nassim Taleb points out, economics is mostly fraud. There's very few actual economists that are actually paying attention, and because because you're trying to study motivation by looking at its end result and yeah. not by worrying about where it comes from. Yeah. Right. So so I'll give you an example. I was bitching about this couple couple three hours ago on my discord server right i was yeah, saying yeah. like yeah here's another example of when you start to dig into something uh, a movement uh, any kind of movement in in history um it just comes down to there's always a belief component right there's always a religious motivation and so when you try to teach history without teaching the religious motivations for things yeah. you just get a really warped view of the world like oh yeah they did it for the money 
I, I can I can explain one thing to you that has never happened. No one's ever done anything for just money. Maybe yeah. they've done it for the things <laughs> money can get them. Yeah. Right. Or maybe they've done it for the way money makes them feel. Like maybe, oh, I want to feel safe, so I'm going to want mass wealth. But yeah. no, like you don't money, get money for money. You don't want money for money. <laughs> right. You don't, exactly. Well said. You don't want money for money. Money doesn't do anything just sitting there. Right. Like I, that's not helpful. It's not an end. It's not an end state. And so that's not why you did it. You you got the money for a reason so that you could do something. Right. But it wasn't it, you're not going to get buried with it and like buy your way into the afterlife. Like, come on. Like, what are you what's going on? Yeah. It's going to be like in that South Park with the uh, with the AIDS. <laughs> right. But but if you look at economics, they'll tell you, oh, yeah, this person did this for this money reason. And it's like, no, that can't be true. That's not, that's not, yeah. that's the, that's, because I never have <laughs> you know, but that's the material result, the thing you can measure about their behavior. And if you treat it that way, you can do good economics. So if you read the Freakonomics series of books, they point this out kind of early on in the, in the first book, like right away, money doesn't work the way you think it does. Incentivizing through cash actually can have uh, the opposite effect of what you think. Right. And the, the, the first example, I think it's the first example of the book that they go through in the first book of Freakonomics. It's a great, great series of books. Everybody should be freaking Lowering the price makes people buy less. Is that what it is? No, no, no. No, it's oh. worse. They, it's a daycare center. And daycare center, people are dropping their kids off like 15 minutes, uh, picking their kids up 15 minutes late. And they're like, we don't want to stay open 15 extra minutes. So what we're going to do is we're going to institute a new policy. We're going to charge people some money. I forget how much it is. It doesn't really matter. I think it was $15. We're going to charge them like $15 to pick up their kids late. And what do you think happens? People pay More people pick up their kids late and pay the money. Oh, why? <laughs> why? Well, because, <laughs> yeah. because money makes it permissible. Yeah, okay, now you're okay. like, oh, we're in yeah, a transaction just, yeah, where yeah. I can just trade my time of being 15 minutes late for That's a little bit point. of my cash. And of course, the only people that send their kids to daycare already have too much money to some extent I mean, we can yeah. we can argue about that but like get, you're already doing the wrong thing daycare is bullshit i said that in my economics video yeah, and now we're getting right. patterns check it out right daycare is bullshit most and so it, it has the exact opposite effect like completely opposite effect well because people don't know how money works i have i have three videos on on money by the way uh so you can check them all out you learn more about how money works um be, but that's they, they do proper economics because they point this out. Like you guys yeah. don't know how money works. You think it's just this straight sort of want more, yeah. you know, trade for whatever. It's not. Yeah. Because it's, it works more like a signal. And that's something I, I do have a video on signals. I probably have to do more on the signals and signaling. Yeah. Now that I've done this space the moment, monologue, I can get into that more. I mean, they're studying biology, right? The moment you <laughs> something like, I mean, like you know, not really, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, we're gonna say, Bill. I was just saying. I mean, the in Mark's example. I mean, the moment you say something like, "Well, if you're late, it's 15 minutes," then people will automatically say, "Oh, great! For 15 minutes, or for 15 bucks, I get a buffer." Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, okay, you guys are expecting this. It's normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you want that, right? It's a signal that you're you willing to that trade problem, that. that. Yeah, you're willing to do the trade. Right, because it's all signals. That's the way to understand the world. These other like psychological frames and political frames, it's all garbage. It's all signals. You understand signals and the want for cooperation because we're highly cooperative creatures. And the world makes a lot more sense. Now, now you some have of the understand. people. Go ahead, Bill. No, I was just gonna say. I mean, that's. I can. I. I. <laughs> I hear people talk about that philosophy. Some of the people that I uh let's say work for i mean they bill out at a million dollars an hour 15 dollars is nothing to them to pick up their kid late wow <laughs> yeah yeah and, and but but if someone's willing to take the money they have the money to give right it's 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 weird to me that people you know get these complicated frames because they are complicated and they yeah. try to understand the world with them because i'm like no, no this is really easy it's signals and cooperation yeah and and when you look at cooperation you, you can make arguments like well 
you know, that's not real cooperation, whatever, right? No, no true Scotsman fallacy thing, whatever, all day long. And it's, and it's valid. The thing is, it's implementation, right? So if I think I can cooperate with you in a certain way and you don't see that or you're not ready for that or you're not willing to, to cooperate in that way, then it goes horribly wrong. That's an implementation problem, right? And that's fixable. Like implementation problems are fixable. What's not fixable is when you have bad intent. <laughs> like I'm happy to cooperate with you if I get it my way. Oh, that's not you know that's not cooperation. Yeah. You see that Dr. Right? Phil podcast with Jordan Peterson? Have you seen that one? Which one? The new Dr. Phil Jordan Peterson podcast. I haven't I haven't watched all of it. I've seen pieces of it. Okay, you should. It's it's one that um should be really watched instead of listened to because it's um there's ones like this every once in a while where there's like kind of a not spoken conversation happening the whole time where i mean like dr phil's kind of stepping on his toes and being kind of arrogant a bit and he's basically starts questioning him and trying to like hold him accountable for like exploiting a lot of people on the show over years and you and if yeah. you watch it and they're like you can like it's it's great I, I don't know how to explain it um but it's 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 great it's it's a really good it's a really good watch if you watch it the way they're both like <laughs> i don't know there's there's a there's a duel happening but yeah no, i like I like to watch those things, um, yeah. a because yeah, you get the body language, super important, lots of signals there that you don't yeah. you don't get. But but I also like to listen to things at regular speed, so I get the tonal stuff. Yeah, right, because it's super important. So yeah, I, I, sometimes <laughs> I do listen to double speed, but extremely rarely because I, yeah. I like to get all the you know, as much information as I can. Yeah. No, that's that's definitely one that should be watched. Um, yeah, and it's it's not even like that subtle. Like once you realize it, it happens probably about a third of the way through. Um, yeah, it gets interesting. Um, so who's who's saying? attacking? Who's attacking who? Um, well, well, essentially, like Doctor Phil's book, kind of, it's just like a Jordan Peterson ripoff, but like without any of the deep understanding of things, and actually kind of fucks up some of the language, which would lead people in bad directions. Really, in, in some ways, um, you know what I mean. But it's just it's not totally bad. It's just like you know, it's not he's not taking himself very seriously. And Dr. Phil is obviously a very intelligent man. And I think he yeah. just recognized that he, he's, he has his ass kind of half in the game and like just kind of wants to be famous and just kind of riding this bandwagon, you know, and he was acting kind of um, subtly dismissive and kind of like, oh, what you're, what you're doing is kind of culty stuff was, was hinting that. And then essentially they kind of, he started switching the conversation to, um, well, I, I think like, what, what's a good line, but they're just talking and, I, I can't specifically say what some of the stuff was because it's it'll just sound like they're talking about nothing. But they just talked a lot about exploitation and the ripple effects of how, of of putting people in the margins at the center and then people thinking that behavior is acceptable and also virtualization, right, right. like the virtualization of the therapy section allowing for psychopathy. And the Dr. Phil in, in these one set interactions is just destroying people's lives and then they never see them again or deal with it. You know what I mean? And right. he's like all, actively like, inviting him to take accountability for that you know what i mean and like make right. the podcast better you know what i mean because honestly um the more people that kind of notice that and i saw some people in the comments all notice that as well um it's just not a good look for him especially he's like trying to start his new um platform and he even at the end Jordan pearson says it's opening on april 1st right instead of it comes out april 4th or 5th or something and april fool's day <laughs> like that yeah he, he did that on purpose but that's that's yeah, a, yeah. yeah it's a it's a great conversation P um, pearson's a smart cookie so yeah, yeah. Yeah. A lot of people can't, you're not going to catch most of the stuff he does. That's no, for sure. no, no, no. Yeah. Very subtle. Very, very subtle. I, 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 I'm so hoping that I could talk to him at Symbolic World Summit. Unfortunately, I didn't get anywhere near the man. Um, but I, but I, I, I do, I do have like a burning question that he may not even be able to answer that, that just like, I just want to know where he got some of his sayings from because a lot of his sayings, like devil take the hindmost, those those are sayings I grew up with, but he was in Boston. So I'm like, did you have those in Canada? Because this is, the, it's fascinating to me, right? Because if he got yeah, them yeah, from yeah. Canada, that tells me something about the world. And if he got them from Boston, it tells me something different. But I just, I just want to know. I just want to know where those came from. If I could find that out, that would tell me a lot about the world. Yeah. Automatically. Yeah. I'd, I'd see all kinds okay. of different patterns. I don't know because I don't know which one it is. Because some of the, some of the sayings he, he uses, and a lot of people I know, they're like puzzled by them. And I'm like, and I grew up with a lot of these sayings. I don't and now they're all going to be everywhere suddenly. <laughs> right, right, right. So I just need to know where he got them from. Right, Yeah. right. 
I did. Uh, I did see Tammy. Tammy's a lot smaller than I thought. She's oh like yeah, yeah, yeah. Tiny, yeah. tiny person. Yeah, I mean, Jordan Peterson's actually a little tall. Jordan Peterson is tall. His, his, his body, he's, I mean, his body was smaller than I thought, but he's taller. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's <laughs> tall. He's tall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, yeah. I haven't, I haven't met him in person. I went to, he went, is in a, uh, LA once or, or downtown um, uh, Los Angeles and I, I saw him there. So. Oh yeah? yeah. Did you go to one of his, his talks? Oh yeah. I didn't just see him walking around. That'd be weird in LA. <laughs> Probably not a good idea. Weird. Yeah. I mean, Maybe I don't know if it'd be a good idea for him to walk around in LA too much. No, no, pro probably not. I saw him, I, I saw him in Charlotte before the fake news virus scam thing. But, um, and I, and I obviously saw him at Symbolic World Summit. But uh, yeah, it, it fa fascinating. Uh, it's fa fascinating that he is the way he is still, uh, but he really hasn't changed much at all. <laughs> it's uh, so, sometimes for the worse, uh, but mostly for the better. Uh, yeah, there's so, some things I'm just like, oh, you just need to upgrade your language a little bit. Just tweak these two, three little things here. That would be great. But um, yeah. no, it's 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 fascinating the stuff that 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 has come from all of that. That's that's the petersonsphere.com website stuff. I got to get my article up on that. I got I got more around the to do. The language thing. Um I I I wonder because um I know oftentimes when I am trying to talk with atheists, I'll give like a very um off description, like a very kind of materialist description, but I'm leaving I'm purposely leaving like a small window and I think it's like people who are more religious see that it's like well, why are you giving this like thing covered with a small window but I, I think of it it's like yeah sorry I, I know I know but that's just from my experience that was the window that brought me into religion in the first place you know what I mean and so yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I I wonder if um because there was a time when I was like allergic to spooky words <laughs> you know right I mean? right yeah and it would, right. it would shut off my brain you know what I mean and I wonder right. if, if, he, if some of that is um either intentional or if he's just being like be like humble or something i don't know um it's definitely it, it rots it feels like it rots my brain staying in that framework you know what i mean so i don't think it's the best right obviously well, it's, you know, like, it's interesting that you say that i've been trying to explain this to people for for years now um yeah it, it, a lot of people don't realize that when you're talking to people that are say part of the meaning crisis crew and not the crisis of faith crew because i think they're different their brains shut off if you use the wrong words it's just that simple. And and the Christians get upset because they're like, well, you're just, you know, John Verveke, for example, uses all these complicated words to say things that we have better words for. That is true. But there's a utility in that. And, and, and I was in the Exodus series. I forget which episode of the first first round of the Exodus series on Daily Wire, um, where Peugeot stopped Oz Guinness and said, no, 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 no. Jordan has a way of talking to secularists and reaching them. Right. Because Oz yeah, is yeah, trying to direct his language into, yeah. into a more Christian frame. And he's like, no, 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 don't do that. Like he's got a way to to talk to these people that you don't have, right? Yeah. Effectively. And so I like that you mentioned that because I keep trying to explain this to people. People don't get it. They don't believe me. I'm like, no, 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 no. You guys are losing audience because you're using the wrong words. And Peterson's able to get the audience he's able to get because of the words he doesn't use. Yeah. And maybe he doesn't even have them. Um, in fact, my 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 one, I, I think I went over this in my uh, Symbolic World Summit recap. Um, you know, one of the things they were doing is talking about sacrifice. I'm like, that's great, but can't use that word. You, you know, you got to use trade-off because the, 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 the secularists won't. It's, sacrifice is seen as a oh. negative sort of a death. Right. It's like, oh, that's that's like war. Sacrifice is war. You know, it's the same sort of valence. It's very heavy valence for yeah. those people. And they don't really understand the concept. So I think you need to start with trade off and, and sort of weasel them into into a, a yeah, more nuanced yeah, 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 approach yeah, yeah. later. Yeah. Right. And he always gets he always kind of goes into that when he's talking about like, oh, you will if you're truly psychopathic, you help everyone else greatly. You know what I mean? But it's like at a certain right. point, it's like there's why would you evolve that way? It would just evolve that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that doesn't make sense. Like, right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, but it, it, it works well to ground that because like, you know, it's like, well, is it actually a, the selfish gene thing? If it is all the selfish gene thing, like that still works. Right. It's just moving towards oneself, you know, like, whatever. right. I don't know. Right. Well, and I think, I think that's why you see the rise of this so-called Neoplatonism, which doesn't exist. 
um, right? It is that's one step up from the uh, poverty of thought that you have with these, you know, sort of humanist or you know atheist views, right? Like it's one step kind of in the right direction, sort of, uh, but it's directional and that's not good. Uh, mm -hmm. Then you get Sam Harris uh, not caring about dead babies in the basement. See, see my video, uh, Most High. I saw that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good video, I think. Uh, that one got a thousand views. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was my first thousand view video, in fact. Um, yeah, I, I mean, that's what, that's what you end up with when you use mere direction. That's why you need orientation and navigation, right? Because the, the, the step to the Neoplatonism, you know, worrying about the one versus the many, which is another binary frame, it's invalid, uh, that, which sort of spawned, uh, obviously a lot of this live, a lot of this live stream topic space. Um, you, you, you need that space in order to re-enchant the world so that you're not stuck in the Neoplatonic one versus many binary, right? You, you need to, you need to understand that there's three things. There's still the nihilism. You're not getting around the nihilism. So you, you, you better know where it is so that you don't step in that. Cause once you're in that, it can suck you in and that, that, you know, you'll, yeah. you'll lose your mind. Uh, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. No. Yeah. Um, but it's funny. Cause I, like when I, when I did lose my mind, um, there was actually points when I like I essentially believe that like everyone that I loved was dead and wow even yeah it was not fun <laughs> um, no that's not fun but like in a way um that was i don't know if like the word is preferable but like there was a time when i was deeply depressed and nihilistic you know what mm -hmm. i mean like obsessed over the idea of life being meaningless meaningless like obsessed over that and that was seem seems less prefer pre pre preferable in a way i don't know how to like put put that i'm not saying it's, it's like easier you yeah, know what I mean? they're, they're both hard. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like one was like there was a deep passion in it, and one right. it, was, it was just it was just tragic. It was just tragic. It just it just felt tragic. Right. And I guess that's what it, what it was. Mm. You know what I mean, is that one I actually there was God there? <laughs> you know what I mean? And well, the there's that one, there's like, that emptiness with nihilism, right? Yeah. And and with emptiness, there is no space in essence, right? Yeah. Like like that's what emptiness is—the lack of potential. <laughs> Right. It's the emptiness yeah. that's the lack of potential, not the emptiness that's the, the availability of potential. Yeah. The way I represented like um, the universe when I was a nihilist is just like I imagined my loved one like floating through space like a mouse. I imagine them as being a mouse floating through space and then just dying. You know what I mean? Like walking around, not knowing that like this is they're just in the middle of a black nothingness and then they're gone again. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's why, that's why I thought of things. It, that's like as little space as you can get with the representation. <laughs> you know what I mean? As far yeah, as, yeah. you know, it's gotcha. just, there's no flesh. You know what I mean? There's no, you know, it's funny that, 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 that that's what I would be like. Yeah. That's what life is. <laughs> that's but, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually remember the, I, I mean, I don't know if we should just get like my dreams. But I, I remember I had a dream one time. This, this is like when I first um, kind of became an atheist you know, hold, hold on. You're going to tell a dream? Is that what I'm you're going to tell a dream if that's okay? <laughs> all right. All right. No, 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 no. That's fine. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to hear you. I just got to take care of some stuff, but I'll, I'll, I'll hear you. Go ahead. Go okay, ahead okay, okay. You. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. But, um, I, w I was kind of just like loosely agnostic for a while. Um, but when I kind of firmly started to really become an atheist and like firmly be like, oh my gosh, like the world is a meaningless place. I remember having a dream, um, and I was running around a house, a circle, a circle, a circle. And this is the only black and white dream that I've ever had. People say that you have like nightmares in black and white. This is the only one that I know of. And I was chasing a girl, a little girl. And all of a sudden, when I caught up to her, she stopped and turned around and I stopped. And she says, you know, this is all there is, don't you? And that was one of the freakiest dreams I've ever had. Now, I mean, it's not. I think about it. And I'm not really even sure what it means now. Um, but yeah i don't know what that means <laughs> but that was that was i think the, the, the dream that that i think of like my first nihilistic um awakening you know what i mean and then i remember googling um uh i would have been 
freshman year of high school. And then I remember uh, uh, Googling, like, do people know what happens after death? <laughs> like, I was already an agnostic, but I was just thought people, was, the general exception, like, thought was like, oh, energy isn't destroyed. And then I started really thinking about it, and I was like, huh? But yeah. Anyway, sorry. That 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 was that that's that that was my dream. Interesting. I mean, usually with dream interpretation, it's not about say the the straight propositions in the dream or the connections in the dream. It's about the images and the symbols that you kind of run into, right? And so, a lot of dream interpretation is wrapped up in, you know, like oh, I was falling through the clouds, right? And it's the fact that you're falling through clouds and not water, right? Or, or not the air, right? The empty air or whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? That's usually how you do the dream interpretation stuff. Um, yeah. and, and a lot of people, when they tell their dreams, they reduce it down to the propositions. Well, this happened and that happened and this happened. Yeah. And, it, and you, then you lose all the, all the signals that will say actually matter, right? The symbolic patterns that, that you need to actually do the dream interpretation. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's, that's, that's sort of what I, what I think is missing from your, from your dream. Well, okay, okay. Well, I, I know that um, normally when I have, not really so much anymore, but normally at that time when I had nightmares, they would be at the house where my parents got a divorce in. And that one wasn't, which is a little weird. The house was empty, which is also weird because it's like, I never lived uh, in that apartment without my mom being there. It was just me, my mom, and my brother living there at the time. And, right. So that's a replacement of your, you know, one woman with another, right? Yeah, I mean, but the little girl, I'm actually, I, 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 I the other day, because I was thinking about this dream recently, -ish, and I actually, I figured out who the little girl was, and now I'm forgetting, and that's probably useful to think about. Um, oh, no, I don't remember, whatever. Um, yeah. Well, just little girl versus, Mom. you know, because it's, yeah, well, usually there's three sort of archetypal women, right? Sister, there's daughter, yeah, mother. Yeah, no, no, no. Usually in, 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 usually in age, right? So there's the younger ones that need to be protected, right? There's, okay. There's yeah, the, yeah, 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 right? yeah. There's the older ones that are motherly. And yeah. then there's like the, the, uh, the, um, the, the matronly grandmothery type archetype, right? Yeah. And so usually they fall into one of those three sort of categories. There's more categories. Those are, those are some, some, some of the three basic sort of categories in terms of age. And then yeah. there's a relationship between your age and their age, obviously. Yeah, yeah, for the each right? one. Yeah. Right. So so, so the, that's the sort of richness that's that's sort of wrapped up in, in dream interpretation, okay, in my yeah. experience. Yeah. I mean, I don't remember why I was chasing her because I remember thinking that she like had something. Mm. Like, and then I'm like, not had something, but like, I don't remember why. It, it, was, it wasn't like... That's okay. It's the chasing that matters. Yeah, exactly. I was just chasing her. I remember if yeah. she was, it was just, it was, it, it was like part of a game. You know what I mean? But like, it wasn't well, maybe, that fun. Maybe you were chasing <laughs> so after like, innocence. Part of it. it was just. Monotonous. Yeah, but it could be, it could be, it could be chasing after innocence. It could be chasing after. Yeah. After yeah, youth. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It could be, <laughs> but it's a chasing that matters. Not, not yeah. necessarily what it, it matters that you are chasing. That's, yeah. that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you write your dreams down? Do you keep it like a dream journal or anything? No, I usually remember them pretty well. Like the important ones, I, I guess. I, I, I guess I should, maybe. Um, yeah, you're supposed to write them down when you first wake up. It's the first thing you should do. Okay, I'll, I'll start I'll start doing that. Normally, um, if it's a really like powerful dream, like I probably only remember like, well, like five dreams in my head. You yep. know what I mean? I don't know. I mean, those were like dreams that like I woke up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, because they were right. so right. emotional um I, yeah it's 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 hard because a lot of times i wake up and it just feels like there are fragments maybe if i wrote them, wrote them down i wouldn't have that problem um yeah i mean i i i do um i used to do a lot of short films and stuff and i still mm -hmm. like um but so like you know carrying around a, a journal and writing down ideas is not like foreign to me i guess never just directly it's with good me. practice for everybody yeah I don't, I don't do it, but <laughs> I should. I've done it in the past. I don't, I mean, I, I, you know, I got up three times in the middle of dinner today and like ran into the office and wrote things down for the stream. So 
whatever, yeah. you know, yeah. Writing things down is super important. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good skill to have apart from everything else. Like even if you get, even if you never read it, the fact yeah. that you're doing it is really helpful. Yeah. 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 I really miss having, um, I mean, now I just write on my phone, but for the longest time I had like the same journal that I wrote down all of my ideas in and drew pictures in for like, um, like two and a half years probably. And then I lost it on the bus. And then ever since then I have, I know, I know. Right. And then I have ever since then, I haven't been able to keep one. I just keep losing it at, like after. And I think it just like my brain is just like, I already put so much energy into that one. It is gone, you know? So like, yeah, whatever. It was a cool Traumatized, journal. traumatized. Yeah. I had like weird poetry and dumb thoughts and drawings, but you know, it's cool. <sighs> but anyways, I should probably, um, I need to eat. My, my my family finished food a bit ago. Um, oh, okay. So uh, I should. Any any closing to, thoughts? Their anything space. you want to anything you want to close out with? Um. Well, I, I don't know. It's it's really um nice to get comfortable um speaking. I think this is the most like uh like comfortable. I think like speaking webcam conversation I've had, um because before, before this I've just done like auditions calling into the Matt Dillahanty show, which is not fun. Um, <laughs> um, I called into the radio like the other day and I was like super nervous. And you saw again today, like I was super nervous when I came up first, but um, sure. So, it, I mean, it was, it was, it was nice. I'm, I'm glad I felt like I actually had things to sh say and, you know, maybe these ideas won't spill over <laughs> in weird ways in my life now that I'm actually talking to them and uh, talking about them. And um I think you said a lot that I'm definitely going to be able to think about. Probably know more about tomorrow after I sleep. So, oh, great! Well, it was Pretty lovely sure. having you on and meeting you, and uh, I'm thrilled that you're getting so much out of this and this experience. And uh, I hope to see you again. I won't be doing this next week, but the week after, probably, um, or whenever. You know, yeah. it'd be it'd be no, great. Whatever. And and look, if you if you want to do like a just a a live stream about a particular topic or something that's not on Friday night, we you know. Uh, okay cool hit me up and and right. i'm i'm always open to that so great okay. have a, yeah, have a good evening. great yeah, yeah yeah either way yeah yeah all right man anyways all right thank you appreciate it sir see you later thank you yeah see you all right well yeah bill showed up i'm i haven't talked to bill in ages this is good to see him um yeah this is the magic of space man uh Old friends, new friends, uh, people showing up and just watching and hopefully learning, getting something out of the idea of space and the interaction with people. And uh, I think I'm going to shut it down, uh, which is good because I'm tired because I've been sick all day. Stupid stomach. Uh, don't don't get don't get illnesses of any kind ever. That's my advice. That that and and don't grow old because no good. Uh, San Juro. Oh, it's good to see you, sir. Um, wonderful conversations you had, by the way, with, uh, on, online, uh, <laughs> one of these days we'll, we'll, we'll do a conversation if you, if you want, um, look, have a good night. No stream next week. Cause I'm going to be traveling for a week. Um, but I will be back. I do not have a topic for the next live stream. I will come up with one though. And, uh, you know, hopefully it'll be a nice surprise for everybody. Uh, and maybe maybe we can talk about reenchantment now that we've talked about space. I, I think this opens up a bunch of stuff now that I can talk about it and then refer back to things like this. Um, thank you all for joining. Buy stuff off my shop. Uh, somebody beat up Google until they give me the ability to uh, monetize better. Um, and Twitter, for that matter. Those, those people. Uh, Elon's disappointing me. Have a good week. Have a good next couple of weeks. I will see you soon. Uh, comment, like, subscribe, tell your friends, threaten people so that they like and subscribe, whatever it takes. Um, and engage in the Discord server if you can. Uh, what you know, whatever it takes. And I hope to see you all soon. Have a lovely, lovely evening.